today. Um, I hope these are working. Um, so in, in Lacan, you know, you have the, the discourse of science, you know, in the university, right? And you have the discourse between the analyst on and the, the analyst. Right? And these are the four the discourses, the master discourses, of which the university is basically the Lacan, pretty much fake news. Right on the way towards science, always questioned, but ultimately it's a kind of you know fake news. But I mean, it, it, it's more complicated than that. But this is what he, you can reduce it to, and of course, the hysteric here in Freud's category, and in Lacan probably um, the um, the psychotic and the schizoid speech. When you read him, it'll be interesting to see how he engages, um, you know, what, why he writes. Uh, Lacan said, I am a poem being written. Very Heideggerian here, right? Instead of we being the vessels through which being passes, Lacan says, I'm a poem being written, and this is the way he writes. In, in, in some ways. At the same time, you know, later on, the poem, and remember that, uh, and I, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, retrospectively, if you will, to, 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 um, uh, to Badiou as well. The Badiou believes that ontology, the being <laughs> written, and, the, and being itself is a mathematical ontology. This is the fault that we have in Western thinking and in, in philosophy, that we have taken up ontology not as mathematics, but as the poem. So the debate, in a very fundamental sense, is between the poetic and the mathematical in the early days. And this is, of course, at Plato as well, you know, where you have the Pythagorean moment, you know, and also at the same time, you know, the poetics that the poets are ostracized from the re Republic. Um, so, so here, um, Lacan has that moment. He's saying this in the in the in the '60s and maybe early '70s. But then he goes the way, and I think I mentioned this uh, two three weeks ago that Lacan thought that the unconscious needed to be formalized in order for it to become the psychoanalysis as the science of the unconscious, we needed a mathematical formalization. So the 70s in Paris around the quote-unquote master discourse, right, <laughs> of, of Lacan, was essentially about taking this and more of the creative parts, in my opinion, you know, translated into many of the comparative literature departments, some philosophy departments, anthropology, right? And then the domain of mathematics and all these technicians became very, very interested in Lacan. So what is the math, math theme, right, that he's going to locate? So Badiou takes this up, you know, as a very serious matter and mm. starts to think through in being an event Logics of Worlds and the new book out, which I think is called Imminent, uh, The Imminence of Truth, begins to take up this ontology, this mathematical ontology. So that's why I want to read him. I want us to at least have some kind of, you know, basic understanding or at least basic exposure to this. So anyway, these discourses are always overlapping, and the fifth discourse is capitalism. And this is in, in the the 1969 seminar, The Other Side of Psychoanalysis. So this is the master-master discourse. <coughs> I mean, Lacan has never said he's a Marxist. He's very friendly with many Marxists, but neither is Freud, you know. As mo most of you know, Freud never had anything really generous to say about socialism or communism. Even though the free clinic movement, he was very much behind, lay analysis, you know and extremely open, you know, et cetera. They just did not think that this kind of utopic speculations or the human nature, which is what human nature for, for Freud was not, you know, really good. 
<laughs> right? <coughs> Just not really good. It's not a Rousseauian notion of, of human nature. Much closer to Hobbes, you know, in many ways, and, and uh, um, you know, that, that tradition, if you will, of theories of human, and Machiavelli, certainly, as well, yeah. And Nietzsche, who really influenced him, you know, especially the Nietzsche beyond good and evil and the genealogy of morals. I mean, I would say that one could glean, if you, if you did a study <laughs> from the genealogy of morals, probably all of Freud's, you know, system, systemics, right, at least in the fundamental way of how he goes about it. And this is why he avoids saying that he read Nietzsche actively. He always said, he signified a nobility to which I could never attain in my youth. You know, but even though Lou Andrea Salome, you, you know her, uh, I think I mentioned her too. She, she was Nietzsche's uh, muse, so to speak. He was involved with her. She did not return the affection. Um, she was um, married to Paul Ray, uh, the English psychologist, um, Origin of Moral Sensations. And um, that's who Nietzsche begins his polemic with in the genealogy of the morals. Lou Andreas Salome became an analyst in the Freudian um, in, in, the, in the movement. He was very close to her, he had tremendous respect for her, and um, she published uh, uh, multiple, <coughs> I don't know if there's a book out, but a lot of her uh, case studies and some of her theoretical work, especially on analogy, uh, have been published. And she had an affair, she was with Victor Tosk, who, you know, we, we saw his name mentioned in The Science of the Unconscious later, you know, so she, she was um, later in her life. After Rilke was also a lover, I don't know if you saw the movie Beyond Good and Evil. Did anybody see the movie? Yeah. Um, um, the um, there's a famous um, she, Lou Andreas Salome on a our cart, and Rilke and um, yeah. and uh, Nietzsche are pulling the cart, and she has a whip. So uh, yeah. Anyway. So anyway, she's an important figure, and, and as is Victor Tosk, right? Who ends up committing suicide, you know, but does very good work on wartime neuroses and trauma. Um, all right, so anyway, I, I bring this up because yes, I wanna go to the point of where, I mean, Freud never made comments like this, I am a poem being written, you're only gonna get this out of a, a Frenchman, <laughs> right, probably. <laughs> <coughs> maybe a, an, an Italian with too much espresso. Uh, but anyway, he, uh, um, Lacan was always doing stuff like this. So, uh, but it's interesting to me because Badiou, like I said, picks up on the mathematical ontology. And Badiou has three uh, major ontologies, being in an event, um, logics of worlds, and now imminence of truth. So this is, this is his ontology, among other books. You know, 40, so 40, 50 books or so. You know, that's so. Those of you interested in this, Zizek and, and Badiou are part of that one wing of the Lacanians that are out there in an active way, you know, although Badiou really distantiates himself from psychoanalysis, even though recognizing its importance, right? Just like Rukor, but in a different way. But you is not a hermeneut. He's not. He's not going to do a hermeneutical thing. So anyway, um, so what I, I want to do. I mean, I know I signed this, and I thought we would do this in two parts. Uh, probably the best way to go about um, the Rukor, the analytic, right? That, that was the reading we <laughs> signed uh, uh, three weeks ago. Um, so today. Um, and let's just finish. Let's let's try to finish um, at least the analytic up to uh, Eros, Than Thantos, and Anaki, um, which is part three. So if you could go to page two hundred and sixty for next time, I think this time we only went up to the interpretation of dreams. And I'm going to try to find. I'll, I'll work with Josh on this. Chapter seven of the interpretation of dreams would be a good, you know primary text to read alongside of the uh, record. And uh, this, this, this will really help. Um, excuse me today, I have very bad allergies. I'm filled with congestion and 
all of this, but I'll, uh, I'll, do, I'll do what I can. <laughs> and anyway, um, let me, let me, um, so anyway, okay. what I'd like to do today is we look at the, okay. um, the, uh, the, the record and also maybe some discussion on the piece on narcissism. Which uh, did everybody get this? Uh, it was it was it wasn't. It wasn't um, I, uh, I found it later, but it was there. I just had okay. trouble. Did you have a chance to read it, or was no, it I'm, no? I'm, okay. I'm bad on that. Okay. I, I have I have trouble with my PDF. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay. <coughs> Savvy. Had I known that, I would have brought uh, the little paperback book that has the this in. <coughs> but, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> well. Um, <laughs> I mean, since mm -hmm. you like uh, Jung, you know, this is also another attempt, you know, uh, against Jung. You know, you can see the arguments in here against polemic. Jung. Yeah, polemic, as well as Alfred Adler. And the two breaks, 1911 with Adler and 1913 with Jung. And this is important to keep in a historical perspective because two schools of psychology are developed out of that. And the Stalinists really liked Adler, by the way. They really liked Alfred Adler. A, a whole group of Stalinists like, like, you know, they would follow individual psychology. They liked the emphasis on work instead of, you know, quote, libido theory. And, uh, you know, it, kind of interesting in that regard. Yeah. My boss at um, Strand Bookstore many, many moons ago <laughs> was a Stalinist. And uh, <laughs> he, all, he loved Alfred Adler. That's how I started to do okay. some research on this. I'm saying, uh, now I know where he's really coming up. Yeah. 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 And that's when they put up the detector so you couldn't steal so much at, uh, at uh, that's right. you know, Before that, I mean, I'm sure the they had books yeah, out on the side book. They yeah. do, they, they put the cheap ones out. Yeah. yeah. But the trick was you find mm -hmm. out, oh, this is going on the sidewalk. You know, you just take it out, you know, or something like that for a little while. Okay. So, um, um, I mean, maybe maybe I can ask you. You want to? I mean, start somewhere here. I mean, I, my my thinking was that Ricor again is very thorough. Or any thoughts about Ricor? Yeah, Will. Yeah, uh, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over yeah. question from the section of reading was yeah. like, what exactly was the motivation for the transition from the first topology to the second topology? I mean, I can sort of see where Ricor wants to go with it, but I, I'm not very convinced by it. I'm wondering what Freud's motivation was for moving from the first to second. Topography. The typology of the unconscious, uh, preconscious, yeah, unconscious, unconscious, unconscious into the ego, um, yeah, exactly. yeah, into this, yeah. And so, like for Ricoeur, like it's clearly very much he wants to show how Freud is going from right. a system of physical forces to a system of meaning, so you can get interpretation. In right. That's right. But I'm just not convinced that that's why Freud <laughs> wanted to move from one to the other. Mm -hmm. It sounds more like the core wanted it to mm -hmm. one to the other. Okay. Good question. Anybody else or some other uh, thoughts about this? Or? Well, Ricoeur is obviously reading multiple texts in this section. And I think the first thing we have to really look at is, again, this claim that psychoanalysis is a science. And, and what Lacour is trying to do is get outside of that it's a naturalistic right. epistemology. Right. This is where he's going. He's trying to take this apart as much as he can. So he's going to begin with the project for the scientific psychology of 1895. And, you know, so um, I think what Freud is doing more is that Freud became more and more enamored and thinking through, in a very pessimistic way, the death drive. I think this is really why we have this different kind of uh, moment here. Um, and that he wants to, since he writes beyond the pleasure principle later, you know, and, you know which is actually after World War I, certainly reflecting on this. And I guess most of you know that he wrote a letter to Einstein in which he said, why war? You know, you know, do you know about this? That Einstein asked him the question, why war? And of course, Freud replied, why war? Because we're basically very aggressive types, right? And that the death drive is always already present. So I think the death drive is crucial here that becomes privileged in Freud later 
you know, or as a lot of people would say, it's very hard to maintain creativity at a high level. It's very easy to self-destruct. Even if you're, you know, a highly creative person, very hard to maintain that kind of creativity over years. And I think this is one of the reasons he said, before the artists, we must lay down our arms because they're in two interpreting, you know, Freud was extremely fond of the poets. It's extremely fond, but they were intuiting things much earlier than the, you know, the, the analysts in the clinical situations and others. So I, I think we have to read this as a body. I mean, I think Record's good at this because he's written books on, I mean, those of you who don't know Record's work, he's very interesting. He wrote a three-volume um, study of narrative in time in which he takes into account, you know, um, many of the advances and theories of narrative to, you know, actually the psychoanalytic situation, the, the therapeutic situation, and its relationship to theories of narrative. And um, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, what, what do you think about, I mean, you know, I'm just trying to frame it in terms of uh, the death drive, you know, the, the tree, but again, and the, and the mistranslation here always is instincts being used because this has not been corrected for this term in in German, right? The, the, the drive. Drive theory is essential, I think, both to, to Lacan and certainly to Freud. And this has been a criticism by the existentialists, in a sense, that it is ultimately a theory of drives, okay. and it takes away choice or the ability for real transformation, which I'm, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, that's sort, totally of, the, yeah, that's sort of the direction I was kind of, just, oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. I, I was so sort we'll, of we'll thinking that was a bit more what, where uh, Freud was going with the change in topography than what Ricoeur was saying. Uh, it seemed to me more about maybe like the position of the ego, right? Because in, right. the, in the pr uh, unconscious, pre-conscious, conscious, it's sort of like an arrow going from the unconscious towards objects. And the consciousness is the ego. That's where the self is. Whereas... And I don't know if that's right. Well, the self self like is a way. construct. It's not an a priori gi given. Right. It's well, a construct. Ricoeur was saying was more the point of the second topography. Yes. It wasn't there right. the first. That's right. that's right. Right. So it's like sort of the, the, the drive, the tree is where right. we really are, then the ego is something constructed out of the, the drives trying to interact with the world or something? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what? Yeah. Go yeah, ahead, Al. Uh, what were we going to uh, talk about? Uh, is, is Tribe synonymous with drive, or are they distinct? No, they, no, it's just, uh, instinct, as I mentioned, I mean, I don't know if you remember, but I've been trying to be somewhat careful here in the translation. Instinct was used, you know, by Freud for bio, bio, biology, for biological things, and to speak of the animal, you know. I, I think I put up this diagram in terms of, you know, the difference between the instinct and drive, and we, we talked a little bit about the biological, Versus the you know the uh, the um, you know Freud as hermeneutician or Freud as you know interpreter right and it's not just a biological theory and you know you have you have a lot of this going on in the tradition this is very explosive stuff because you've had many deviate just like in Marxist studies you know you have the economic determinists you have the open ended you know you have the culturalists all these kind of factions. You know, the same thing is going on, obviously, within the psychoanalytic uh, movement. So, um, anyway, I still think that there's a shift in Freud once the death drive is put out there, that this becomes central to the later Freud. You know, that this is really one of the ways to rework somewhat of the topography of the, the mind, right? Anyway. So the, the death drive comes in at the same time that he makes the transition to the second topography? I think so, okay. yeah, yeah. I think in between, I mean, he begins very, very uh -huh. actively there, you know? Okay. I mean, before that, there's a lot of gleaning from the, from the uh, you know, the, not only the case histories, but, he, you know, he writes, say, for our narcissism, and you begin to see these differences, right, in terms of the love object, primary narcissism, secondary narcissism, of which... I want to say this too, since some people have read it here, and I'm sorry to jump, but I think it's important that Bernard Stiegler argues against uh, primary narcissism, and this would be a very good point for people that are in the therapeutic uh, fields to look at, that Stiegler says it's primordial, primordial narcissism that's really at stake, not primary. 
and he articulates this in a book for a new critique of political economy. And he says what's being lost here is auto-affection, <coughs> more in the Kantian sense. So he's kind of going back to that, that part of our dilemma in terms of digital, the digital world, if you will, or digitalization, or constant cybernation of individuation, that what's really being lost is really self-affection, right? Even if there's a self, right? Or self, you know, just auto-affection in, in a very primary, you know, in a primordial sense. So he's gonna take it one step back, back here, okay? So, um, yeah. So, I mean, again, uh, and th this is, you know, my, obviously my, my reading of it, right, that Freud discovers this death drive, right, which Reich argues with. You know, Reich is against the death drive. He says this is nonsense. It's secondary masochism, you know? <laughs> yeah. He says it's not, not well, he writes this, and this is one of the main reasons for the break as well. And not sufficient recognition by Freud either, because Reich had a very father, you know, a lot of transference going on there to the father at uh, that time. So, so, but anyway, so, but for Reich, the death drive was crazy, you know, and, you know, and, and a much more bioenergetic model in Reich, in a sense, if you look at the cancer biopathy, you know, some of the work that he's doing there. It's, it's much more biologically oriented, bodily oriented, in, in a sense, or at least in the explicit sense, you know, yeah. All right, so I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll go to this section in the text. Um, um, but again, he's gonna begin with the project itself, right? And um, uh, energetics and hermeneutics. So the epistemological, you know, um, uh, problem, and you can see what he's doing. I, I want to go to page uh, 466 because the problem is stated there in uh, record. The difficulty in the Freudian epistemology is not only its problem, but also its situ a solution. At the outset, Freud did not clearly see the entanglements of his point of view in the metapsychology. The successive presentations of the topography bear the mark increasingly less pronounced, it is true, of an initial stage in which the typography is cut off from the work of interpretation. Okay? So this is, you know, yeah. What we call the quantitative hypothesis weighs heavily upon the economic explanation. The result is all the later presentations of the typography suffer from a residual disassociation. We will look for the key to the initial divorce between explanation, which is interesting, right? Because now we're going back. I mean, I don't think you were here. I did a little thing on critical hermeneutics with, with the um, um, Delphi and others, explanatory, you know, models and hermeneutics versus that of, you know, just the interpretation in the project of 1895, right? This will be the object of the first chapter, and then he will talk about the. The, the interpret chapter seven, which we should read, that takes up the line of the project, but also goes beyond it and paves the way for the integration of the work of interpretation. So Ricoeur is going to read, you know, 1900, the, the problem being stated, right, in terms of a division between explanation and kind of on the embryonic side of interpretation. The interpretation of dreams marks the moment of a Freudian hermeneutic and, and a use of in interpretation, right? And then he's going to go on the metapsychology, 1914 to 1917, and the metapsychology includes, even though Freud doesn't write beyond the pleasure principle until <coughs> well after this, but you can see the years of World War I, 1914 to 1917. The metapsychological works are obviously totem and taboo, Beyond the Pleasure Principle, The Future of an Illusion, Civilization and Its Discontents, to, to name a few of them. There, the other ones, you know, the writings on art, etc. Okay? So, for the most mature expression of the theory, and concentrate on the what between instincts, and this is interesting, between drives and representations. So again, F Freud is not using the old phenomena New Emil, or subject-object, for those of you interested in the whole subject-object. For, for Freud, it's drive and representation is the movement, not subject-object as in Hegel, 
or as we learn from Lukács and others in the Marxist tradition, and especially the Frankfurt School. So where interpretation is much more bound than Freud to the drives, right, and how those drives are represented. This, this is a very different kind of approach than you get in the old subject-object. Nietzsche himself denied categorically the subject-object dichotomy. I remember yes. he, he just, I don't know, what he replaced it with, just the élan vital? The will. <laughs> no, the élan vital is Bergson. Yeah. No, no, no. No, no. But but Bergson. I know the will. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, the will, will to power. To power. Yeah. That replaces but you're it. you're reading in Nietzsche always the will to power. The two central concepts, and in, 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 we'll get back to this with Lacan when we go into the repetition, but the two cent central idea, uh, concepts for Nietzsche are the will to power, which is you know the title of his last series of fragments, which really, in a way, are a prolemagama to a political theory. Nietzsche was writing on becoming, or thinking about becoming the new Machiavelli, which, you know, his madness stopped that yeah. short, right? And second, secondly, the other part is the eternal recurrence of the same, which he actually went to mathematics departments to have formalized. He thought that he had found the key to phenomena in the eternal repetition of the same, and he wanted to get it mathematically <laughs> formalized. Right. So this is, you know... Yeah, this the is nature. Of the end. Was that the beginning of the? Well, end. maybe so. Maybe yeah, yeah. Or you know, this is the drive for recognition in the Hegelian uh, sense uh, at work. So, but anyway, we're going to go back to this because in in in, in Freud, the rep, you know remembering uh, repetition and working through a neurosis is absolutely crucial. And how is this notion different of repetition than you see in philosophy? Wieder Holung and Heidegger, where you're hauling along the past, right? How does it differ in, in Freud? How is it different in Kierkegaard? Because repetition, you know, he writes, you know, you know um, the theory of repetition um, in, um, in an early work of Kierkegaard, you know, after he uh, says he can't get married to Regina Olson, yeah, and he, he writes that either or and uh, repetition. And uh, you know how this is used in, in modern, um, you know, philosophy as well. So, yeah. All right. So anyway, um, and then how do we ideate? And this, to me, this last sentence I just read, is very much like Schopenhauer, who is not mentioned here. The world as will to represent. Right. right? Very interesting that this notion of Schopenhauer, who's anti-Kantian, anti-phenomenal. New Emil realm thing in itself, right, in, in a sense, and writes a book, The World as the Will to Representation. And so Freud, in a way, you know, has these two influences <laughs> that he doesn't really talk about philosophically, you know, in a way, Schopenhauer and, uh, and, uh, and Nietzsche. Um, so anyway, so from moving from force to language, and again, going back to what you talked about earlier, for Freud early on, the project for scientific psychology is coming out of physics and Helmholtzian physics, right, and the state of the art. He really wanted this to be a science, right, that the, the, the physicists would recognize as a science of the mind, right? But what happens is, is when we read the 1915 um, um, uh, piece, the, the unconscious, is that ultimately psychoanalysis' greatest claim is that it's offering a science of the unconscious, right? That you don't really have a quote-unquote empirically verifiable quantitative, you know, notion of whether <laughs> the success rate of transference or the success rate of, quote, the talking cure or whatever. So this is not, you don't really have this. But then it's a science of the mind. Yes, the presupposition of the unconscious mind, which I think everybody is in agreement with uh, this, this discovery, which was not Freud's discovery of himself, but he's the one who actually elaborated it, you know, and made it into, you know, this, this, yeah. And, and, and in a way, very dialectical, because it's a play of forces, you know, that's, that's, that's going on constantly. And uh, so anyway, integrating force within language lies in the positing or the emergence of desire. So you can hit, see Ricoeur here is trying to incorporate everything from the 1895 piece to the metapsychology to the Lacanian moment of, you know, where desire is, or Freud himself, Wunsch, right? 
and and uh, you know, yeah, and, and lust, right? Lust and desire and wish, all all working at, at once, right? So anyway, so in energetics without hermeneutics is his first chapter, which is a good thing because it is an energetic model, right? It, he's coming out of this theory of 19th century energetics. So this is important to remember too. And so he's very good. You know, this was, um, you know, um, the constancy principle. So he takes this from Fechner uh, and from uh, and Helmholtz, right? And, and then he says, you know, the constantly, uh, the, the, the topographical early on, again, and going back to your question, which you know is a good starting point, I think, is what is this language changed for Freud somewhat? Is he going through undergoing something, or is it a continuation with a new new language after the uh, death drive is is discovered and, and sort of privileged in his last work? I mean, you know, the mention the reason I I mentioned why war. This is exactly what Freud replies to Einstein. You know, yeah. I mean, because you know, Einstein thought you know we could become smart enough to avoid such great uh, conflicts. And Freud said, no way, no, no way. And if you look at the, the history of the United States, you know, since the 60s, <laughs> 50 years later in terms of reactions, I mean, I'll, I'll put my money with Freud any day of the week in terms of, you know, the, the regression that, you know, we, 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 we've gone the, through the in the wars, et cetera. Just, yeah, destroy all of humanity, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and look at nuclear nuclear buildups, you know, look, 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 look what goes on, you know, and yeah. I mean, this is pretty obvious in a sense. And I mean, you know, I have books such as Eros and Civilization that I mentioned in Life Against Death, which are, you know, obviously interventions to to the um, to the uh, nuclear buildups of the 1950s, the Cold War. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, Eros and Thanatos in, in, in Eros and Civilization is actually a plea by Marcusa at a meta level to say, we want to live, <laughs> right? And this is what we can do with the reality principle and the dominant reality principle and try to reframe this and see it as a performance principle and, you know, take it up. Yeah, David. Yeah, yeah. Einstein yeah. was not so optimistic. I mean, he spent much of his years, including right after World War One and, and the atomic age, especially arguing against the use of atomic weapons, arguing for denuclearization. Right. Um, he, he was very, very active politically, it turns out. There's some new, right. new books, called, right. one called The Einstein Files, I think. Right. And, uh, J. Edgar Hoover had, so he lost his security co uh, clearance, among other things. Right? No, the CIA watched him every day at that Princeton. Yeah. <laughs> they used to report he, he doesn't put on the right color socks. He puts black on one foot and white on the other. <laughs> like he cared, you know? <laughs> if you're living out there, who cares about the socks you wear? <laughs> right? right. Yeah. Nobody's looking except yeah. the CIA. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. There's, there's an yeah, please. Yeah, they're yeah. doing a yeah. somebody's doing a uh, a graphic novel, or not a graphic novel, but a graphic uh, representation of Marcuse's work now. Really? Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's huh. interesting. Yeah. 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 I, can't read it. <laughs> I, 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 I haven't to seen it. Rachel <laughs> comes up with the best question of all. Right here. Yeah. I mean, it's a, in no, the form of a statement. <laughs> I haven't actually seen it, but I've seen oh it referred God. to. Right. You know, so. <laughs> I don't right. know. <laughs> right. So, <I> know. <laughs> yeah. so again, you know, this is part of the. I mean, if you want to do this again, you know, I, I, I started by saying, personally, I look at Freud in three periods, and they all overlap. But the first is the medical, you know, under the influence of Charcot, the studies in hysteria, the use of hypnosis, all of these things, the neurologist, the neurological, and also really wanting the scientific language that he can borrow from physics and that he uses in the beginning. And this is his, you know, working apparatus about that. Then you begin to see the shifts, and I agree with Rapport, 1900 really marks a major shift. And this goes into the beginning of the clinical, the, you know, Freud, but really the dream work, you know, it's the royal road to the unconscious. And then, you know, the later, the metapsychological. And they're all overlapping with each other. I'm not saying that it's just strict periods and you can divide them into three. I think it's just a, a way of looking at him in terms of his own, you know, breaks and, and cleavages from his earlier positions and what might be going on. So anyway, um, 
I mean, I'm not so sure we really need to read all, I mean, you know, he's looking at, you know, dialectical transformations of quality into quantity in science, how this is put out. You know, he, he talks about on page 76, consciousness gives us what we call qualities, right? Um, thus, we must summon up enough courage to assume there's a third system of neurons, perpetual, perceptual neurons, they might be called, which are contrivances for changing external quantity into quality. So, so you yeah. nailed that. He nailed, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. major law of the dialectic. Yes, indeed. Major law of the dialectic. Freud tried to attach them to the quantitative system by assigning them a temporal um, property, periodicity. The period of neuronic motion is transmit, transmitted without inhibition in every direction, as though it were a process of induction. This enables Freud to differentiate himself from the school of parallelism and the epiphenomenalists, right, during this period. So Ricoeur is very good, again, at historicizing this, and, and you know, again, you know. Um, and, um, and consciousness is not an ineffectual double of the nervous process in general. What is yet more serious is the fact that the whole system rests on the simply postulated equivalence between unlust, unpleasure, right? And the rise in the level of tension on the one hand, and between pleasure and the lowering of the level on the other. Since we have certain knowledge of a trend in psychic life, psychical life towards avoiding unpleasure, and that's a Epicurean principle, by the way. That's the first principle of Epicurus. Avoid pain. First Pleasure principle. is the avoidance of pain. Yes, it is. That's the definition. That's right. Okay. We are tempted to identify that trend with a trend towards inertia. In that case, unpleasure would coincide with a rise in the level of quantity or with a quantitative increase of pressure. And I always thought if I was going to rewrite being in time, I would call it pressure in time instead of being in time. You know, a geology of morals, this, this kind of thing, you know, in a, in a way. It would be the perpetual sensation when there is an increase of quantity in, you know, um, in the, and, um, yeah, at least just in the scientific uh, notation. Pleasure would be the sensation of <coughs> discharge. Okay? What do you think of that? Yeah, is that okay? I, mean, I think that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll, yeah, okay. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> the function of the uh, Wilhelm Reich. The function of the orgasm. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is a mere postulate, since unpleasure and pleasure are sense intensities, which Freud localizes along with sensory qualities in a third type of neurons, the W neurons, and since he characterized these intensities of the cathexis of W by Y, right? Um, and, and like intercommunicating pipes, you know? I mean, the, the, the writing is, is really good. This is in the origins of psychoanalysis he's citing from. Um, anyway, in fact, this is a new example and this is a new example of dialectics here, of the transformation of quantity into quality, which Freud's license to the previous transformation by again appealing to the phenomena of periodicity, already called upon to account for sensory qualities. Desires or wishes enter this mechanistic theory. So, records careful, mechanistic theory, right here, it's interesting through the intermediary of the tracks left by the experiences of pleasure and unpleasure. It is to be assumed that the cathexis, or investment, where did we, where did we finally decide we'd use this a term, investment, psychic investment? Position. For cathexis? Yeah? Invest, yeah, investment was one of the... the one of the possible yeah. uh, translations, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And... Um, that the, it is to be assumed that the, uh, the cathexis of a pleasant memory and a state of desire is far greater than the cathexis of mere perception. This assumption allows for a first definition, and this is good, I mean, it's really careful here. Think, think about how this hermeneutical process is going on. This allows for the first definition of repression. How does he get to this? Equated here with primary defense as the removal of cathexis from a hostile memory image. Okay? And we see this working in both 
the, the essay we read on the uh, unconscious and also in the piece for today the, on, on narcissism. However, at this point, the system starts to break down. The pleasure unpleasure combination sets into play much more than the isolating function of the psychical apparatus. It sets into play the external world, food and sexual partner, and with the external world, other persons appear. It is remarkable that Freud, in designating the overall process that encompasses being aided by others, chose to speak of the experience of satisfaction. And he quotes Freud here, um, you know, um, on uh, primary. At every st stages, early stages, the organism is incapable of achieving this specific action. It is brought upon by extraneous help when the attention of an experienced person has been drawn to the child's condition by a discharge taking place along the path of, an inter of internal change, for example, by the child's screaming. This path of discharge thus acquires an extremely important secondary function of bringing about an understanding with other people and the original helplessness of human beings is thus the primal source of all moral motives. Okay. Very, very interesting here. Yep. Uh, and really, in some ways, Nietzsche. The experience of satisfaction is indeed a sort of test experience related to reality testing and marks the transition from the primary to secondary processes. Try, Freud tried to maintain the detour through reality within the principle the framework of the principle of constancy by linking the regulation by reality to the sole pleasure, or principle, excuse me, of unpleasure. Unpleasure, and this is interesting too, this is Dostoevsky, this is Christianity, mm -hmm. this is the Book of Job, all of this. Unpleasure remains the sole means of education. <laughs> <laughs> well... The educational apparatus in this country certainly well, follows that. The, the, the you know, Dostoevsky said the origin of consciousness is pain. Pain, yeah. pain and the attempts to avoid it. The, the whole thing goes together. Right? Yes, it goes together, yes. We're, we have to think this together. But I like this here. Unpleasure remains the sole means of education. Like right? Too. So the best therapy sessions are the painful ones. Uh -huh. According to Freud, this is what I mean. According to Ricoeur, at least at a primary level, if if the therapist is both educator and healer, or is, is thinking that way, yeah, which you know, I, it seems to have happened, you know, in the United States, at least in some schools of psychoanalysis, that there was a, always the educative process going on alongside the attempt to help. Right? And I don't see why the two should be separated, you know. Yeah, yeah. Not just the United States, but France, as it well, big, you big believe time. Foucault, discipline and punish. Well, discipline and punish in Foucault is really about uh, uh, Bentham, right? And Bentham's, Bentham wrote a whole yeah. system of rewards right. and punishment for, for criminal, for the penal system. But Foucault and, wants to expand yeah. that to all kinds of institutions, including education. It's the threat of punishment in Foucault that's more, even greater than the punishment in some ways. This is the interesting thing yeah. about a book like, because in French it's to inspect and surveil. Mm. It's not discipline and punish, wow. it's to inspect and to surveil. It's an interesting, you know, it's a kind of translation that's more catchy in English. You discipline someone and you punish them, right? But it's to inspect and surveil is really what he saw in the Panopticon apparatus. What, what uh, is the French yeah. for the yeah. first book? Surveiller. Um, not um, Punia. Oh, uh, not um, Punia. Um, yeah, yeah. The inspect was, uh, I, I forgot. You but can't translate Punia. Yeah, yeah. 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 Not, it's, uh, it is Punia. Yeah. I yeah. don't know. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to remember the exact... Uh, I surveyed something and survey. I can't think of the yeah. French so title. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I was just trying to say yeah, yeah, that no, it I became part of the psyche in, its, in and of itself, in assuming that that punishment, the assumption that punishment was coming, was all that was needed. Right. See, yeah, I, I hear what. Yeah, that, that that's what you know. That's why Foucault begins with this very vivid that Damien's the regicide, right? Because they show what happens. 
to this person, and he goes in graphic detail, and then he shows the architectonic of the uh, of the uh, the panopticon itself. Now uh, Bentham created this monstrosity where, you know, this is the new god. It sees you right everywhere, but nobody knows where the point is, where the center is. So this is a, a massive decentering operation. So God is no longer the spirit of the geometer as in Descartes, or the clockmaker like in Newton, or the mathematical formula. This is all just this constant decentering operation. You know, this is this gives it its power. I think you know. So this is the this is Bentham's contribution. Bentham considered himself a reformer. Oh yeah, way. I know. Big time. I mean, he really did. I know we have this kind of bad taste about him since uh, <laughs> Foucault's, but you know, he he really considered himself. He was doing good things on morals, legislation. You know, uh, you know, setting up new rules, treatment of the poor. You know. Now, even Victor Hugo wrote a Gr famous poem, uh, The All-Seeing Eye. Uh, he equated the conscience with the all-seeing eye, right. and he equated that with God. Right. I, I, it's a, I, it, I read the poem years ago. I don't mm -hmm. know. It's a famous poem by mm -hmm. Hugo. Mm -hmm. He was an oldish, you know, show. You, he had Not some, all pantheon. Some, no? Yeah, some degree of, <laughs> some degree of uh, <laughs> thinking. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, okay. So anyway, look, I mean, look, I, I, th I think what I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to do here Sorry. is again, no, no, it's okay. I mean, it's uh, the, the the Freud. Freud is really ultimately really trying to think through pessimism in history, and you know, the goal for Freud always was to make unbearable, you know, make unbearable misery in everyday life a little more bearable. There was never quote unquote a revolutionary project here mm. in terms of uh, the elimination of suffering or the elimination. I mean, I'm sure, yes, of course, really? they think about this, but in in the real scientific sense, right, in terms of all the, this theory of drives that he has, right, it is really ultimately to make, you know, this unbearable suffering more bearable in everyday life. Yeah. Never revolutionary. Yeah. Well, I never, I mean, revolutionary in terms of its discoveries and theories, but I never thought that it would really have a revolutionary import in terms of, you know, the eliminating of human suffering. You know, it was never that way. No. This is why, you know, some people argued heavily with the Marcosa, because they saw in Ariston civilization a very utopian mm -hmm. kind of speculation, even though it's very beautiful, et cetera. You know, this is Stiegler. Stiegler, by the way, in the book, um, again, I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've been reading, uh, you know, Stiegler now for about five, six years uh, consistently. He, his, um, his notion of uh, uh, capitalism has lost its mind. And in that capitalism has lost his mind, you know, we have, <laughs> You know, have to be. We're, it's very pessimistic where where we are. You know, I mean, for Stiegler, there's no more sense even of the internal memory. <laughs> so I mean, in, in a way, that that's broken down so much. So, you know, we're we're in a dilemma. Yeah, I was. I was yeah, please. Yeah. Before you go further, yeah. could you ex 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 explicate a little bit more on the panopticon and how it. It's it's uh, relationship to this. Well, I didn't. Chris brought that up. Okay, I mean, Chris. Can, <laughs> All right. Uh, no, in, yeah. <laughs> a, a, yeah. a prison. His idea of a prison yeah. was circular, and there was a pr prison guard in the yeah. center. Yeah. And what he did was to watch all of the prisoners at any given time. At any given time, you as a prisoner did not know whether you were being watched or not. So you internalized that being watched, you, because you could be watched at any given time, you always felt you were being watched. You internalized the prison guards. Mm -hmm. And then the relationship so and pleasure, <laughs> getting back to that. You, you internalized the prison mentality. You this was an architectural plan that he drew up. He was a man of many talents. So he drew up something called the Panopticon. And the idea of the Panopticon is that the gaze itself mm -hmm. could never be seen by anybody, including the guards. <laughs> that everybody in this space, enclosed, right, was, as Chris was said, was being surveilled, like kind of the ultimate voyeur. 
that sees all, right? But you never see the voyeur at all. Like, or as Sting no. said, yeah. every mo move you make, I'll be watching you. Sting. Sting. We can't get quotes for Sting in this class. I mean, why you go that level? Bob Dylan, maybe. I don't know. I mean, Sting? Yeah, okay, that's all right. <laughs> Yeah, every else. move you make. I think he was talking about something else. And, and they, uh, How should watch? No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Anyway. But, uh, yeah, I mean, again, the, the, the idea here, listen, I, I'm trying to say, you know, that, that you know, the pessimism that we're going to see, right, in a sense, we're trying to understand this relationship of a, a hermeneutical approach, right, okay. in terms of philosophy, the critical hermeneutics or political hermeneutics turned out, you know, Jameson's book, The Political Unconscious, is based on a kind of critical hermeneutics. You know, it's not just straight up Marxist dialectics. There's an incorporation of hermeneutics and, you know, if you will, Al Althusserian dia dialectics going on in the political unconscious you know, in a way. So we have a cultural unconscious, a political unconscious, we have nothing but unconsciousness out here at this point. The, 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 the task, I think, and he, he uses the word task, you know, instead of relating always to, okay, we're going to make only everyday life, you know, a little more bearable, that's, that's the Freudian position, Freud himself, right? Mm -hmm. And I think most of his, you know, uh, followers in, in a way, and, and, you know, we have nothing but disasters in a way, we have some successes, but a lot of disasters in the in the case history and in, in both movements. You know, as as Guattari said, it's just filled with shit. You know, the whole the whole thing is it's just filled with you know uh, you know all kinds of between the Communist Party, the psychoanalytic movements, and stuff. This is one of the reasons that a book like Anti Oedipus has taken on. You know, to say look at what this led to. <laughs> right, ultimately, did we really get anywhere with it? Well, I think that this is, you know, certainly worth <laughs> studying. I don't really think there's something bad with pessimism, you know, in it, in it for itself. I think we sometimes, especially in the United States, always think it's going to be better. You know, uh, we, we always have that kind of intuition. We're conditioned this way from day one instead of really to think it through all the way down in terms of the pessimism. So, uh, again, to go back to this, you know, when you get a, a, in England, you get someone like Bentham working on this, then how is it p applied in Attica? You know, look at 1973. Some of you knew Annette Rubinstein. She wrote a br brilliant piece on, on Attica about this. So did Jacqueline Millier about No One Sees the Gaze, a Lacanian uh, attempt. I, I can make copies of that for us. I what think it'd be since she wrote about Annette, I knew her well. And she wrote a very good piece on Attica, a very long oh, yeah? piece on the Attica uprising. But, I mean, this was an uprising against this kind of panopticon. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at Sidney Lumet's film of this period, to go back to this, you look at uh, Dog Day Afternoon, you're also seeing a similar kind of <laughs> approach, right? <laughs> a very similar kind of approach. When he's waving the flag outside Attica, but at the same time, the position of the camera. And this is something, too, that, you know, I think that we, we, we forget as well why film is so important, because it's the camera position in history. Who controlled the camera for so long? The Catholic Church. Think, think about who's controlling, who's controlling the, the, the narcissism in, in a certain way. I think this is very interesting when you start looking at this in terms of the arts, especially cinema and painting, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and especially in the visual arts. Very, very important to see this. Well, now it's Google. Yeah. Gaga. <laughs> you know, you think about the infantilization of, uh, of language. You know, you got Lady Gaga to Google, you know, Google, you know, and all this. I mean, you really start thinking about this, this cyber language that's going on. Yeah. 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 Well, now we Yahoo is right. Went to Tulane <laughs> University. <laughs> he built a big business school there for them. Yeah, yeah. The founder of Yahoo went to. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I know that because I went there for. Anyway, now forever. we have the incredible profusion of, of closed circuit TV, um, including well, especially coming out of China. But they they've been selling it to like Ecuador, you know, countries right. throughout the world. But it's it's. Um, 
<clears throat> you know, I mean, hundreds of thousands of, of cameras all over the, <laughs> certainly all over China, but, um, you know, there's a, a question of how many people, who can actually watch all of that, you know, or keep tabs on what's going on. But, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a piece on Ecuador, which is where that's really caught on, you know, big, and it's, uh, apparently it was, it was started under Correa, unfortunately, <laughs> before Moreno, Took over, yeah, I, we can quote Leonard Cohen here. The rich have their channels in the right, bedrooms yeah. of the poor, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, in a way, yeah. It's yeah. not really That's used, it's, the rationale supposedly is to fight crime, but there are many, many okay. instances where nobody, nobody, you know, crime takes place in front of cameras and nobody responds. Mm -hmm. but it's a rationale, though. Right, mm -hmm. it's a rationale. I mean, really, right. it's to sure. keep tabs on the population. And, uh, well, know. the best place to do a crime is across the street from the police station. Yeah. Every every street kid knows that right. it's worth the salt, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think they may even have cameras out. There yeah, yeah. That they yeah. don't look at either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah exactly. You know, okay. And, and I think if yeah. we could just yeah, David. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, just to continue this for a second, I, the, the question of um, uh, who has the capability of managing all that information and therefore being somehow at the center of the panopticon at this particular moment is particularly interesting as in, in my field of media studies, attention is turned towards machine learning and algorithms, right. which is the answer to that question, right? There, there is no single human or even single party organization, government, corporation, et cetera, that can manage all that information, which is why the folks the entities, the organizations that have the capital to invest in those technologies mm -hmm. are trying to manage all that information by building algorithms and machine learning. To, to, to me, they are two, they're manage yeah. the vector of they're two ma major abstract enemies right now. One is what you just said, the algorithmic determination of everyday life. You know, who can look at the algorithm? Uh, yeah, it, it, that's it, itself it's sort of escaping the control of, of the folks who are building it in order to control population. Right. There's a book out and just now about that called Surveillance Capitalism. She's a she's a she's a capitalist though. Uh, <laughs> yes, she is, but it's very no, interesting. No, she's smart. I mean, she, she's a Harvard she, Business School person. Yeah. She's yeah. exposing a lot yeah. of yeah, this. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, that we're we're <laughs> we're constantly, you know, uh, the, 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 the drive and desire of Wall Street now is the mastery of the speed of light. That's why you have these high pay, pay, you know, high frequency trading systems, et cetera, that use algorithm, it's parallel. It's a kind of parallelism. That the new drive is no longer Promethean, that's a 19th century notion, from Marx the patron saint, those who steal the fire from the gods, show you how to make, you know, what Marx did in Capital, you know, he, he dedicated his, uh, dissertation to Prometheus, the bad patron saint of knowledge, no longer a modern myth. Epimetheus, which is Prometheus' brother, you know, who was, you know, the, the fault of technics, maybe a little bit. Sisyphus, we're always pushing the, the um, rock up. We get close, but then it falls on us and we got to start over again. And this is a story of Left, certainly of leftist practice or anything that's really progressive, if you will. And that's sort of like the progressive regressive uh, method works in some ways, you know, in, in, in some ways, because you have to start all over, you revise, you go back and do, you do your categories. But now the new thing is to be basically master the speed of light. How fast can you make these systems go? How fast can this happen? This seems to be the new desire. This is the, not Frankenstein, post Frankensteinian monstrosities that we're living with in the in the cyber cyber age. So everything's like this. I mean we don't we don't experience it in, in our everyday life. We see the speed. But think about the games, the video games, all the war toys that are out there, everything that's that's going on in this culture and how accelerated it is at certain moments. Yeah. And you, you talk about information. Information is not learning. And this is another reason why this whole thing of painfulness <laughs> in terms of education is important because the kids, you know what I've learned this semester? Honor students know how to cheat better than the regular students. <laughs> now how to do what? That's what I learned. They know how to cheat. They know how to cut and paste better. They know how to hide the sources, you know. <laughs> right. They try this on me, you know, of course, we have to rewrite, you know, from the inside out. It's extra work for the professor because you can't flunk them all. So this is, this is what you're dealing with. And these are the best students. Pick a few to flunk. 
This is the best. Yeah, yeah but go ahead, please. Yeah. It yeah. occurs to me too. Yeah. I mean, as yeah. far as um, if we could see that in a way as an intervention into um, this relationship between unpleasure and education, where the point is to, um, I guess, in a venue union kind of way, to make war pleasurable as much as possible. So these systems that are sort of managing uh, both how uh, law enforcement and that kind of apparatus can observe us and can intervene in life, but also the way consumer society can manage us and intervene in life right. becomes uh, largely um, a way to keep us uh, from facing uh, what you talk about in the, in the next class, like the real anxieties that right. we have to right. deal with, both sort of the existential trans-historical ones and the very yes. historically situated ones. Yes. So like you get things like um, positive reviews uh, of a movie like the new Avengers movie on the basis of some of the characters are actually lost forever this time and therefore finally there's a superhero movie that forces some of the audience right. to deal with actual loss within the narrative that they're right. following right which of course is only happening because some of the actors are running out of their contracts now yeah of course you know, and, but yeah. Like that, and this that, branding that, only has a certain shelf life to it exactly. how many planet yeah. of the apes can you do how That's many right. superman three you know That's one right. two three four Batman meets superman yeah. you know the That's whole right. thing but this, this like oh. small element yeah. Yeah, yeah. of like yeah. facing what is unpleasurable about life yeah. and then therefore me, possibly yeah. learning something right. is like wow hey look Big yeah. compliment to this movie because there's yeah. a loss in it. That's I'm not saying it. one should nurture pain, right? Or one should yeah, go looking so for it. That's not the idea at all, <laughs> especially for now we threw out a term like prosperity Marxism last week. But anyway, <laughs> um, the, the, the thing is, Kafka, the, the, the difference between the parents and the educator is that the educator is the one that makes the child aware of the pain that life is, right? in many ways. So this is very imp important, that education itself is painful, right? And, you know, this goes back to, you know, very standard stock remarks like Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living, right? Malcolm X, the examined life is painful, right? You get this constantly throughout, throughout history. So I don't think, I think Freud's within that tradition when he men mentions this. And this is another thing, too, that I think we, again, in the America and uh, optimism in a sense people go say you know into a therapeutic situation thinking they're going to come out as a happy machine you know to use that language of the <laughs> 70s or something like that you know whereas happiness isn't even a value within reach now especially in terms of this is where the Marx comes in to, me, to my mind that happiness in a way I, I take up an Aristotelian definition that you know de, de, demonia which is the, the, the notion of well-being is, is really what we should be gunning for. But that means living in accordance with, in Aristotelian language, with the psyche, right? Living in accordance with one's psyche, the soul, and its requirements. Very few people even close to that, you know? I mean, you know, this is the group. To me, the critical force of Marxism points out those obstructions much more, you know, in, in some ways, as a critique. As a solution, I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, convinced at this point, especially where we are today. I mean, you know, um, you know, is the state going to save us? I mean, you know, look at all these people—20 people in the presidential race. <laughs> you know, and, and and all the projections, but that somehow the grandfather Sanders or the other grandfather, you know, the sleepy one that Trump's already called those sleepy Joe, right? I mean, you know, they, they just said they're feeding Trump. I mean, it's it's amazing to me, right? In some ways, when you really think about it, right? Just feeding him, huh? Yeah. He's branding them. They were talking yes, about branding machines, yeah. Yeah. but he's give he's branding Uncle. Uncle Creepy now. It's, yeah. It's <laughs> creepy, Joe. Uncle creepy, creepy Joe. Joe. Oh, creepy Joe. Creepy Joe. That was the original. Oh, yeah, the original is Creepy. Okay, yeah, but they went sleepy. with, with uh, yeah. Sleepy and it, well, he got a little soft. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about, what about Trump's the getting soft. Right? <laughs> Trump's soft on America. <laughs> 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 he must have something to well, say what, about him. What Trump does very well is brand. He yeah. brands himself <laughs> and he brands other people. Yes, he normalizes everything that's ultimately coarse, vulgar. Now, I wouldn't stupid. say normalize. He brands them. That's how we understand things. Yeah, it's part of the problem in the culture now. You know, we we've turned into this kind of. You know, everybody has to be an entrepreneur. 
You know, you you know, you're in academia. You have to send out, you know, hundreds of applications. You've got to pitch it differently to whatever institution you're you're sending it to. You know, you have to have all these little. You know, everybody's got a startup. I mean, you know, if everybody was successful in a startup, we have a hundred million millionaires in this country, right? Et cetera. So this is what it's become. I mean, this is what. Uh, this, this system is produced at this point. Anyway, let, let's go back to the text because he's got some good things to say in the beginning and I want us to be at least on the same pages of the... Um, uh, 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 what what page is I'm that? on page 78 now. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. When first examined, these themes, unpleasure remains the sole means of education, fit quite well with the central hypothesis. In the primary process, where the apparatus functions most in accord with the principle of inertia, discharge takes the pace, path of a recaphexis in the memory images of the wish for objects and of movements to attain it. It is assumed that this reactivation produces the analog of a perception, i.e. a hallucination. I have no doubt that the wishful activation will in the first instance produce something similar to a perception, namely a hallucination, Freud speaking. This mistake... How does he equate perception with hallucination? I mean... Well, this is in the first, the first uh, activation, the first instance. How it happens. It's a hallucination for, for Freud. Not, not as we talk about, you know, you're, you know, people said Heidegger was hallucinating when he, oh. you know, talked about the Fuhrer. And most people say, no, he wasn't hallucinating. <laughs> no, <laughs> wrong, wrong choice of words you know, in some ways. Okay, this mistake produces real unpleasure and an excessive reaction on the part of the primary defense. To others, to, to, together, these two can be biologically <laughs> d d damaging. Chapter 7 of the Dream Book, again, will postulate no discrimination between images and perceptions in the primary process. Going back to your question, you know, the pre-conscious is the place of images. That's where more, if you take a Freudian topography in the early, in my view, from what I've noticed in years of teaching and, you know, just observe my own observations, most people live in the pre-conscious realm. It's an imagist society. It's picture thinking. Everything's picture thinking, you know, that, that's coming down. So in a sense, there's been very little conscious thought out there, you know, we're really in that pre, uh -huh. you know, yeah, pre, pre-conscious. John DeLillo, in one of his good novels, some of his novels are worth reading. He has a whole section called "Image and Spectacle." Right. To sum up the American culture, image mm -hmm. and spectacle. Okay. It's a very good. Uh, okay. I forget the name of the book. Mao Chu or something. Yeah. Some of his novels are worth reading. Really. Yeah. Okay. Like yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so anyway, and to account for this, we'll divide, devise a topographical regression with a functioning of the psychical apparatus. And this is in foreshadowed, he wants to make, you know, sure that we're aware of it's foreshadowed in the principles of science for scientific psychology. The assumption is made that the excessive charge of the desire produces an image similar to the indication of a perceptual quality. Well, I have much to say at the proper time about it. For the presence, how does discrimination come about in the secondary process? First time, Freud establishes a connection between discrimination between the real and the imaginary, and the function of inhibition, attributing the latter to what has already been called the ego organization. It is a point that will never change. The constant cathexis of the ego, the function of inhibiting, and reality testing will always go together. Where then an ego exists, it is bound to inhibit primary psychical processes, right? To make this new idea accord with the system, Freud postulates an organization of neurons with a constant charge, which is a network, and this is a nice one, of cathected neurons well facilitated in relation to each other. You know when you say you're clicking on all cylinders. That's a you know, nice cliche, right? No, no, the, 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 it's working in this, in this sense, right? Uh, the text will also contain the first sketch of a genetic explanation of the ego, as in the ego and the id, which is much later, by the way, I mean, you know, it, later on this reserve of energy arises by means of cumulative borrowings 
And you, you get this language of ec economics here. It's very interesting the way this is going on in terms of almost like a Nietzsche's creditor-debitor situation or also this transformation constantly of quantity into quality, you know, the notion of discharge vis-a-vis -vis laws of thermodynamics. All, this is all, all going on, right? By means of borrowing from endogenous quantity, this bound energy forms a system of tensions at a constant level. I like the system of tensions. You know, instead of saying you're tre stressed, you should say, I'm in a really high point of my system of tensions or something like that. I'm so tired of hearing this word because, you know, there's probably, you can't live without stress. You know, now I'm asking, is it negative stress? Is it indifferent stress? Is it, you know, is it true? Live is negative? Stress. Yes, the live is to be stressed. That's good, I like this. Yeah. Yeah. That's for next yeah. hour. Yeah. Yeah. Next stress. hour is stress? Poetry okay. has stress. Poetry, poetry does have stress, yeah. And what is inhibition? Pressure. Yeah, yeah. again, pressure. yeah. Right, of course, yeah. So what is inhibition? And again, I like the way Ricoeur works, you know. This is, again, phenomenological reduction at work. Go back to the definition, right, and then elaborate it in terms of what has, has, has happened before. Freud puts it as follows. The ego learns not to cathect motor images or the ideas of desired objects. This restriction or limitation, which foreshadows the firmus, famous Verneinung, and for those of you who don't know, that's denial. Verneinung, right? This is crucial denial. The movement by the way of the no, and you know the difference between denial and disavow? Disavow, you're aware of something, but you still say, capitalism is shit, but we can't do anything about it. That's the kind of disavow that work, you know. Or, I don't really want to think about it. A lot of people say that. It's too, too, too much to think about. Yeah. I mean, just as of all what I know, when it's come to consciousness, you know, et cetera, instead of really replacing you know, it down. So anyway, so the ego learns not to cathect the vanine by the, the movement by way of the no is presented here as a mechanical effect of the threat of unpleasure. Yeah? So he's really trying to look, in my, my, my estimation here, Ricoeur is attempting to, um, if you will, get to the thing itself, repression. <laughs> what is repression? Because we've never really known exactly. We use the term, we see how it operates maybe in the text, but he's trying to get to, you know, let's look at really what the, what is this repression really about, right? Ultimately, right? It's not clear, however, the moral motives and the mutual facilitation alluded to above fit in with the hedonistic uh, uh, principle, the mechanical, you know, um, uh, effect of the threat of unpleasure, but how it fits in with the hedonistic principle. He admits that he is unable to give a mechanical explanation how the threat of unpleasure governs the non cathexis of quantities accumulated in the ego on this occasion he state, from this point onward I shall venture to admit any mechanical representation of biological rules of this kind, and I shall be content if I can henceforth keep faithfully to a clearly demonstrable course of development. Okay, still more d difficult to give a mechanical explanation of the connection between inhibition and discrimination. For it assumes that discrimination is based on indications of reality arising from the system W. It is in this report of a discharge coming from W that constitutes an indication of quality or reality to Y. How does this inhibition enable these indications to operate? He focuses on the difficulty. It's the inhibition brought about by the ego that makes possible a criterion from distinguishing between a perception and a memory. And this becomes interesting here, you know. What is the difference? But the explanation is a description of the problem to be resolved. Uh, I, I won't read all of that, but anyway. Um, which will cut out, I will read it, I'm sorry. <laughs> the next is carried to the point of hallucination and a complete generation of unpleasure involving a complete expenditure of defense made to describe as a psychical primary process. On the other hand, these processes, which are only made possible by a good cathexis of the ego and which represent a moderation of the primary processes, may be described as psychical secondary processes. Will be seen that the sine qua non of the latter is a correct exploitation of the indications of reality and that this is only possible when there is inhibition on the part of the ego. 
We have thus put forward a hypothesis that, to the effect that during the process of wishing, when you wish for something, inhibition on the part of the ego leads to a moderation of the cathexis of the object wished for, which makes it possible for that object to be recognized as not being a real one. I haven't seen the word censor yet, and and, the, and that term, <laughs> censor, I know in my reading, is that, is using that inhibition. synonymous with is inhibition? Using inhibi no, no, okay. censor is a different thing. It means inhibition? Yes. Inhib no, 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 he's not using censor yet. He, no, inhibition, inhibition means inhibition. All right. Right. <laughs> inhibition means inhibition. Inhibit. Right? You're inhibited. Yes. Right, censor no comes later, his theorized. Sense, censor begins in the later topography when he goes into the Latinates of the ego id and the yeah, superego. Yeah, and the superego, in a way, yeah. becomes part of the, the censor thing. And this is where Sartre right. goes against right. the, uh, goes against the, um, the, um, uh, uh, the Freudian um, construction in, in, in that he says, if the superego knows what to censor and not what to censor, how can there be an unconscious if it's aware of what to let in and what can't to let in? But of course, Sartre's not really understanding the drive and, and the, the unconscious. You know, later in his life he admitted that there was an unconscious. <laughs> he said this late in the 70s. After, you know, you know, many, many years of struggling against this. I mean, mm -hmm. if you've read Being in Nothingness, some of you, uh, Being in Nothingness in one way is a, certainly an attack on French psychoanalytic Freudianism. Mm -hmm. Not especially on Lacan, but on French dominant. Bonaparte, the, these people in the field at that time, as well as many other ones, is really going after that. And existential psychoanalysis is his attempt to go beyond the Freudian moment, right? Which is, the things is, yeah. Yes, by the way, there's a yeah. new translation of being in nothingness. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. come out. It's, yeah. It was well reviewed in the London Review of Books. And yeah, so yeah. By but, Jonathan Ray. Yeah, yeah. Who was one of uh, Sartre's early interlocutors in the uh, English world, yeah. Yeah, the, the, um, but the, re the review in the London Review really gives also, it, it, it's, it's more about the summation of, of Sartre's Life and career up into up to that point, um, and uh, and also how the how the nothing just got published and the milieu around the war years in Paris and uh, so all, all kinds of very interesting things. But uh, anyway, the review, if you can get a hold of one review, it's worth reading. Just yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I, I would suspect uh, nausea is the thing that really made uh, Sartre's career because it was a yeah, popular yeah, book, and yeah. Gallimard made a fortune right. on it, and Sartre lived the rest of his life off of the Gallimard. Hmm. <coughs> you know, he had a stipend mm -hmm. for, uh, for life yeah. from, uh, from Gallimard, and from the editions Gallimard. Right, he had to come to Gallimard's defense when Gallimard was, uh, um, uh, was it accused of, uh, of um, being a collaborator, I think, with the Nazis? And the, Post -war years, well, Sartre wasn't exactly a major figure in the resistance no, himself, well, this, this but anyway, <laughs> 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 like, people would like, he'd like to believe right, that, yeah. <laughs> that was his delusion. Everybody was a member everybody, of the resistance. Oh, everybody, I was in the resistance. Yeah, I, mean, I was a member yeah, of the resistance. Sartre was, uh, I saw you. <laughs> 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 yeah, let me just see if Peter's coming or if I'm taking the class. Yeah, yeah it's going to be late. Yeah. So, um, he, he not yeah. Only was, was not a member of the re Listen, I, I, I keep mentioning these things because I think this becomes very complicated, mm -hmm. you know, in the sense of that yeah. we all live in this period, right, where a lot of this stuff has been hidden, a lot of this stuff is not really actively mm -hmm. talked about. I think it's very rich in a sense. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, you should fall on one side or the other. I think it's important to understand that existential psychoanalysis came out of what Sartre thought was a very bankrupt, you know, mediocre French practice in psychoanalysis. There was never an ongoing, um, um, you know, um, confrontation with Lacan. You know, that came later with, ba one of the reasons I want to do Badiou is that Badiou is very close to Lacan, yet still maintains the distance from philosophy and psychoanalysis. And, you know, and Freud always had this th thing, and people know this, that the philosophers for him were, you know, lived in, you know, idealist, you know, um, 
uh, positions. They do not have, um, you know, a handle on everyday material reality and, you know, can be very delusional, even though he quotes many, especially Aristotle in the dream book. He begins with the, the, the Aristotle's interpretation of dreams in chapter one. Are we right. going to do Lacan in this class? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll do, we'll, you know, we'll, you know, I mean, we're not going to read them line by line. Which I'd like to do, but but anyway, <laughs> we'll do the four fundamental concepts because that's that's, that's the that's really crucial, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, but what we're doing now is is again this kind of looking at Freud, you know, through the hermeneutical lens. You know, I mean, Lacan Lacan is very influenced by phenomenology. You know, so they're not so far apart in terms of where they're coming to entering the the, the field, right? In a way. Lacan is, 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 is a different animal than Paul Ricoeur. He's not as nice, he's not as, <laughs> <laughs> not as, not as uh, you know, uh, open-ended, uh, open I think, and, you know, he's not as careful in terms of every little step of the reading, even though, you know, Lacan has this incredible ability, to my mind, of really taking the meat or taking the heart out of what's happening and showing it to you, you know, or exploding something. Yeah, in a way. Record's an attempt is not to throw bombs. It's to get, generate understanding, <laughs> right? <laughs> the other one is, a, you know, much more provocateur, right, in, in many ways. All right, but let, let, let's go on here. What, what I want to look at, you know, attention here, page 81, and, you know, going back to what David Wind, uh, Winters was talking about, the, the uh, media studies and the informational, uh, um, you know, um, um, culture that we live in, you know, attention economies are very important now yeah. today. And Record is also written on the attention economy in a, in a book on philosophical anthropology. The first chapter is devoted to attention. You know, and this this is important. So, conceived as the interest aroused in, in, in five by the indications of reality. The explanation that Freud proposes that economic, the interest persists consists in the fact that the ego has learned to hyper perfect perception. And you know how people say, that's your perception. That's how I see, you know, how you see it. This becomes a hyperactivity, right, in a sense that can be very divorced from reality. You know, how did you get to that? How did you see that? How, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So this is very interesting in terms of, uh, yeah, but this remains again, only a mechanical and qualitative explanation. So he's going to go on through this, does Freud stay in mechanical, right, and hypothetical explanations in the early stages, you know, in, in the project for scientific psychology. This is Ricoeur's, you know, kind of guiding question, if you will, right? So, in theoretical thought, no part is played by unpleasure, page 82, you know, after they talk about bond, bounded energy. Uh, in theoretical thought, no part is played by unpleasure. Now, um, this is the clearest instance where description is seen to be going on beyond the mechanical explanation. So now he wants to step back and look at what cuts explanation off from any work of deciphering, from any reading of symptoms, signs, is the pretension of making a quantitative psychology of desire combined to Fechner's quantitative psychology of sensations corresponds to a mechanical system of neurons. In this regard, the project is Freud's final attempt to give an anatomical page. translation, page 82, of his discoveries. The project is the final parting of the ways with anatomy and the forms of an imaginary anatomy. The topography, to be sure, will always be couched in the language of a quasi-anatomy. Consciousness conceived as a sensory organ. A surface organ will remain a quasi-cortex, but the attempt to localize the functions and roles attributed to the agencies of the lighter topography will never be made again. We must go even further. This final attempt is also the first step in the emancipation of psychology. The tenor of the text is psychological, not neurological. So this is the beginning, what I would call, I mean, at least in my vocabulary, right, is Freud, the beginning of Freud too, yeah, right? Clinical. Yeah, clinical. yeah. Clinical. the clinical and the, and the dream work, right? At the same time, Freud was writing the project, the anatomical um, basis of the system was being undermined. 
So divided between the clinic and the laboratory, between Charcot and Bruca, Freud is clearly closer to the more clinical-minded French than to the more anatomic, anatomical-minded Germans. This is good. This gives you the theater, right? He's more going to the see the the, the weekly rounds of Charcot with uh, you know quote um, you know um, women on stage you know alleviating symptoms of hysteria etc. And learning from Charcot this 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 moment, the criticism of theories of localization, which he formulated in his critical study on aphasia, that was 1891, as David uh, uh, sent around, right, had made him wary of any premature organic explanation of psychical disturbances. But above all, and this is good, the great discovery of those years, the one that was to estrange him from the scientific milieu of the university and the medical profession, the discovery of the sexual etiology of the neurosis remains purely clinical and not paralleled by any proper organic hypothesis. In particular, the clinical entity of hysterical paralysis is established in opposition to the anatomist. Anatomist, I'm sorry. Everything takes place, Freud remarked, as if there was no such thing as an anatomy of the brain. Okay, and very, very, very good here, I think, yeah? So again, the central text that is eliminated here by the neo-Freudian revisionists in the United States and what one could call the Americanization of psychoanalysis, especially with the way it was pulled up in the 50s, is the theories of infantile sexuality, yeah? Which created quite a stir with Jeffrey Masson's that in the Freud archives, John Malcolm's book in the 80s, in which this actual seduction is really taking place. For Freud, I mean, I don't know, I can be corrected on this, I can be called out, but I don't think it matters if it takes place or not. You know, the actual seduction, you know, in terms of this. I mean, I know it's much more brutal if it actually takes place, but for Freud, in terms of the theory of infantile sexuality, that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's universal for him. I don't know. You have any thoughts about this? You, you, yeah, please. Yeah. I mean, in terms of clinical work, it matters a great deal. If yes, in clinical. Is believed yeah. or not believed. I mean, yeah. But theoretically, do you think? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make. Yeah, yeah. I know. But, yeah. Um, well, theoretically, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. But, yeah. You know, but, um, I mean, why? Uh, let me let me ask you this yeah. question. Do you think he covered it up? That it's actually going on like crazy in Austria? And, uh, I don't know about yeah. Going on by crazy. Certainly, I think with Dora, the, Dora is the, the case where it, he really seemed to turn a kind of a blind eye towards right. you know right. what, what was going on with, uh, mm -hmm. with the family. Right. Um, you know, and from what we we see now, I mean, it probably was going on <laughs> pretty, right. pretty frequently in the uh, right. um, Victoria and <coughs> Indiana. But b let me let me ask you this. I mean, yeah, yes. yeah. Go ahead. When were the seductions? Uh, what age would that take place? This hypothetical seduction. It's seduction of the child by one of the parents. Well, David David knows the clinical stuff better than I do. What I mean, what, yeah, what was, age? I mean, there's this what more age of a. Well, you know, I. Um, you know, I don't remember the specifics of Dora or, or some of the other cases, but I would imagine that we're not, you know, really small children as sometimes we hear about now. It was probably more yeah. teenagers and uh, yeah, it has to be and, later and women. Huh? Right. Um, well, that was later in terms of that, but Freud is talking about you know the sexual life of children and infantile yeah. sexuality. That's why the title, infantile sexuality, that's being played out at that level. Not not so much the seduction by an adult, etc., yeah. but Certainly being encouraged and to look at children at play, you know, this is what he's, what he's talking about. This was a break, both for Jung and Adler, which is in the narcissism, you know, I mean, what's nar narcissism's problem? He can't hear echo. That's the myth, right? Can't hear the other. He can't hear alterity in terms of the myth, right? Only sees his own reflection in the mirror. But when echo comes, right? I mean, this is the myth, right? You know, right? I mean, you know, this is, you know, you know, you know the group, Echo and the Bunny Men, right? That was an attempt to create a new kind of alterity by popular culture. But, but yeah. Anyway, I, yeah. 
I mean, I, I'm just I'm just mentioning this because it seems to me that this was more the more provocative parts of Freud that has been not really talked about at all. Yeah. You know, we don't really. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's certainly within the family. You know, right. we now know when you you know the Oedipal and all kinds of currents going on. Uh, you know, unconsciously more or less. I mean, um, I think you should look at the perverse uncle. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just, you know, when you're reading the guests, always find out who the perverse uncle is in the, in the family uh, romance. Well, Joe Biden is called Uncle Joe. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we had Uncle Sam, too. Works there, yeah. And, 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 uh, Uncle Sam, the, the, the biggest pervert of all, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Of course, in French, Perversion is the version of the father, right? Ooh, good one. <laughs> right. It's the story of the father, hmm. right? Yeah. Jean <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Let's let's go on. So you see what record I think what he's trying to do here, and one of the reasons reading it is he's trying to distantiate, you know, Freud both from, you know, the scientific anatomical language, right? And in, in the one one sense. He's also trying to distantiate you know, Freud from the biological, right, mm -hmm. into more, now let's look at him in terms of what does he mean by interpretation, you know? Mm -hmm. And also trying to cross that line from the explanatory models more into the interpretive. And, you know, in, in philosophy we would call this as speculative. I mean, it's a speculative science, but speculative, you know, speculative means that you're setting up a specular, you know, so, you know, to look at look at it's a it's a visual uh, thing again. So you know uh, this is very very um, uh, I think apt for for record. Okay. So anyway, the um, the episode decides of the study of aphasia during the same period. The incursion of the cathartic method of Breuer, coupled with his disappointment with electrotherapy, I guess shock treatment, as we call it, right, confirmed the probably psychical genesis of symptoms. Confirmed, excuse me. Hysterical patients, Roy Brewer and Floyd, in the preliminary communication, suffer principally from reminiscence. Reminiscence. Um, page 83. What disappeared by a psychical procedure must have come into existence by a psychical means. It is exciting to follow, and everybody knows that he wrote to his good friend um, uh, Wilhelm Fleece, right? for years in which the, these theories were elaborated. Very beautiful re reading to, you know, go through. You know, it's very, very revealing. As well as in his accompanying notes about the development of the idea that the physical energy of sexuality demands a properly psychical stage. The essential reason for constructing the concept of the libido at its psychological and non-anatomical level was to accomplish, excuse me, to account for the disturbances that affect the psychical elaboration of sexuality. The libido is the first concept, the first concept that can be said to be both energetic. And, and, yeah, energetic and non-anatomical. The three essays on the theory of infantile sexuality will de definitely determine this concept of the psychical energy of the sexual instincts. Okay, perhaps we can go further and again, records reading the project, dismantling it, right, in terms of where it is going to go, and then the next chapter, if you read this, is going to be on interpretation and dreams. Right? We we'll go further, the project is not merely a mechanical system cut off from the interpretation by its anatomical hypothesis, it is already a topography, linked by the underground connections to the work of deciphering symptoms. Hermeneutics is already present in this text. And this is what Rucor is looking for. Yeah? Uh, uh, yeah? First, the notion of quantity. It's surprising <coughs> that it never, never measured, but from the outside it has a concrete, tangible characteristic that it owes to clinical observation. This line of approach is derived directly from pathological clinical observations, especially from those concerned with excessively intense ideas. These occur in hysteria and obsessional neurosis, whereas we still see the quantitative characteristic emerges more plainly than in the normal. 
In this regard, the phenomenon of anxiety for next uh, class, uh, Chris, anxiety very clearly manifests the ter tangible presence of quantity. Anxiety is quantity laid bare. The mechanical aspect of quantity is ultimately less important than its intensive aspect. We must go further that all the mechanisms described at this period have been raised to the level of what Freud will soon call work. Dream work, the work of mourning, right? All the dynamic concepts, defense, resistance, repression, transference, transference are deciphered in the work of the neurosis in the psychical elaboration of the libido, as we said above. By the same token, the energy concepts are already collective, relative to the whole activity of interpretation brought into play by the etiology of the neurosis. Finally, the theory of constancy and its anatomical translation for little support to the edifice. When the project barely <coughs> drafted succumbs to doubt, only the clinical observations on the neurosis stand firm. The sexual etiology of the neurosis was actually a much better guide than any mechanism or, me or quantitative system. From the beginning, Freud had the distinct impression that he had touched upon the great secrets of nature. Okay? So this kind of finishes Ricoeur's first phase as he's going to go on. Should not conclude, I, I won't read all of this, but at the bottom, having reached the ultimate phase, so this is the last six uh, lines, of the metapsychology, one may then wonder whether the Freudian theory has not restored, this is an interesting proposal, that the nature philosophy which the schools of Helmholtz endeavored to overthrow and Goethe's Weltanschauung, which the young Freud had admired so much. If so, then Freud will have brought to pass the prophecy he made about himself to return to philosophy by the way of medicine and psychology. Okay? Nice, huh? Nice kind of circularity here that he pulls off. Yeah? Any, any, any thoughts about this? So he's going to, you know, Ricoeur is going to at least position that we're going to go through this nature philosophy, right, to maybe look at him as well. And who writes the major philosophies of nature? Hegel and, you know, and Schelling, on the organic and Schelling. Yeah? Well, both together, and they're, they're actually in competition with each other. You guys know Schelling? You know, this was, uh, you know, a, a, a contemporary. Schelling, Holderlin, and Hegel were students together, and they wrote a... a um, they, they, they founded a tree of liberty and they were they students. They studied in Germany? They started in Germany, studied to begin. Germany? Yeah, to begin. And uh, they all were, you know, very close with each other. Then the German police came around. <laughs> Hegel is master at covering it all up, obviously. He builds a, a, an incredible edifice of the system. Schelling and Hegel start vying for students at the university, you know, and Schelling's much more Spinoza's pantheist, whereas Hegel is, you know, really in a certain way the final justification for the Judeo Christian, you know, fulfillment of history and, you know, uh, one way of reading him, but, uh, you know, anyway, the absolute, the system of absolute knowing. And Holderlin, some people says, went mad, other people say he feigned madness. So, you know, to get out of going to, you know, prison or to be arrested. But Holderlin was the poet to which they all attained to. And you can read Georgi Lukács. You think about this in terms of German romanticism and German poetry. Between Goethe and Holderlin, you know, the entire tradition kind of grows out of this, this moment. Goethe writes on nature, right? Or I recommend the that you, there is the Of the film. Holderlin. Oh, the film. There is film. Yeah, I'll put that on the board. Yeah. It's, it's on YouTube. Yeah. Bernard Stiegler, Jean Luc Nancy, Philippe Lacour La Barth, and uh, who else? Uh, uh, the filmmaker, right? Uh, who did Our Hitler. Um, what's his name? Hans Jurgen uh, Sieberg. I can't remember yeah. right now. I yeah. can look it up. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's his Yeah. Great poem of. Uh, and, and then you get to hear Heidegger's voice. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Heidegger reading the poem is at the end. It's a funny place. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, this yeah. this is a kind of uh, I think in a way, Ricoeur's way of uh, in a literary sense of, of putting Freud in the context of 
of uh, German Romanticism. Okay. Yeah, just before that. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Out, there's a really good footnote at the bottom of that page. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, basically, re reiterates what you said, but it's. Um, uh, but that was my Cyber original burn. ambition, um, you know, to return philosophy to philosophy. My original objective. Uh, yeah. Well, then he says, for that was my original ambition before I knew what I was intended to do in the world. Yes. Right. Exactly. Uh, destiny. Yes. He used to refer to himself in terms of his early development and when he started to have these, you know, radical discoveries, especially in the dream, in the interpretation of the dreams, and then some of these seminal essays that were, you know, like the science of the unconscious and or the unconscious narcissism and all of this, that he really felt that he was working in splendid isolation. He has some very beautiful poetic, you know, uh, phrases to describe his work. He never describes himself. It's interesting, it's always the work. And it always reminds me when Heidegger would introduce Aristotle, you know, in the class, he would say, Aristotle was born, he worked, and he died, let's get to the work. <laughs> that, was, that was it. So, I mean, I think this was part of this culture, you know, that they, they uh, grew up with. You know, you could see Marx, too, the same way, you know, comes out of this tradition, you know. I mean, Marx never really did much work on Schelling, but certainly read Hegel, certainly read Kant, you know, was extremely, you know, I mean, to put it mildly, well, you have to do is read the footnotes in Capital, which most people who teach Capital don't read. This is part of the problem. You don't really have dialogical readings, you have imposed readings. Mm -hmm. For those of you that were in Stanley's class earlier today, you have these mechanistic, you know, deterministic readings. This is what dogmatic, Marxism is really about, you know, when the dogma is imposed, you know, yeah, contradictions in capital work. You know, I kept my mouth shut today a little bit, but anyway, uh, you know, I could see, boy, when we're, you know, talking about Georgie Blakhanoff and uh, you know, these kind of people. What so, is this, this standing or status of Ernest Jones' great biography? It was originally... Three volumes. Yeah, yeah that was the status. I, I, it was I written three volumes. Yeah, yeah. You had the condensed? Condensed Yeah, yeah, one, right. but I, but yeah a little paperback. Right? No, yeah. no, oh, really. yeah, the, yeah, it's, the, yeah. it's about 650 pages. But it's yeah. A, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's yeah. interesting. I mean, he was I, referred to as the Englishman. He helped Freud a lot, actually. He got Freud into uh, London. He, he actually saved uh, Freud in some ways from was Vichy. He, was he a member of the Vienna Psychoanalysis? He was a member, he was one of the committee members, British school mainly, you know, and he helped honor Freud and Tavistock and all of that. But I mean, Klein was the one who in England, you know, took, you know, took, took over. She was the, you know, yeah. She was, the object relation school is very interesting. I mean, we don't have time to do, I mean, I, again, I'm not, you know, this is not my field, but I mean, I've read a lot of it. I love Bernicott's book on playing and reality, and, you know, and, and uh, you know, some of this stuff is really good. Uh, yeah. And, uh, Lacan had tremendous admiration for Winnicott mm -hmm. and Klein, both yeah. of those two. But Winnicott mediated between the two yes. fractured wings right. of the, yeah. under Freud and, and yeah. under Klein. His school used to, when I was at uh, Johns Hopkins, when I go, I go to rounds at Phipps in the early 80s, and I go down to Phipps Clinic, which is the psychiatric unit there, and a lot of the people that were trained by Winnicott would come and give presentations, and a lot of very good stuff on schizophrenia. These people were really good, so, you know, this was part of the medical uh, school and the psychiatric clinic, you know. The, the Bloom, now the Bloomberg School of Psychiatry, I'm sure, since he gave <laughs> a, he gave a billion to the humanities, actually. Yeah, which, you know, to the, the, the other campus, you know. Johns Hopkins has the downtown medical school, the Peabody Institute for Music, and then the Homewood campus, which is all the humanities. Yeah. So was, was Winnicott welcomed by the Freudians, or? Uh, yeah, oh yeah. oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, he had yeah. a way of... Balancing out. Yeah, yeah, no, he's very, very, he's extremely, yeah, balanced. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, in a way, I mean, Adam Phillips today is kind of like the Winnicott of his generation. And then you have the poets like D.M. Thomas. Do you remember D.M. Thomas? The White Hotel? The novel about the, you know, you know about uh, Ferenzi and Freud and... And uh, uh, what was her name? Sabrina uh, Jung and Spiel, Freud. Spiel, 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 yeah, Spiel right, right. The White Hotel. 
but it's a novel, yeah, written by D.M. Thomas. Did he break English psychoanalyst? With son, son, he didn't break with friends. No, Ferenzi was the, the son. He, his friend. Right? The son. Oh. He called him his son. <laughs> yeah, Sandor, the Hungarian. But he didn't agree with his therapeutic techniques. When he went which to was Clark, active engagement with when he went uh, with uh, to Clark University in 1900, he went with Jung, and I read somewhere he would have preferred to go with Ferenczi, but they couldn't arrange it. I don't know right. if it's valid. Uh, Ragtime, by the way, by E. L. Doctoro, that he wrote up in Shroon Lake, right uh, <laughs> up there. Um, um, he um, he he reports on this visit and going to Coney Island. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Very funny passage in the in the uh, in the uh, uh, novel Ragtime by uh, E. L. Doctorow. Yeah. Anyway, let's let's go quickly to uh, a little more on the hermeneutics, and then we'll we'll. Um, I mean, I'll maybe just point out some things in the narcissism, and we'll go back to that, and then and read chapter seven of the interpretation of dreams for next week. Um, so the difficult chapter in question of the hair to the project left unpublished by the found an outlet in the interpretation of dreams. So Ricord's making a claim here that somehow that the project for scientific psychology found its way, draft form, in chapter seven on the problem of representation. Yeah? We're doing that right now? No, we're gonna do it next week, but I mean we're looking at Ricord's interpretation, right? What, what page? This is page 87. 87. Yeah, All right. yeah. Okay? So Okay, so this is interesting the way he frames this too. Again, another, another I think very clever way. He says um, two charges, you know, uh, have been supervened. The first is so great that no one could overlook it. The psychical apparatus of the interpretation of dreams functions without any anatomical reference. It is a psychical apparatus, and this is where your friend Daddy Da, the Wunderblock, the creation of the psyche. Right? And, and Freud in the scene of writing. If you want to read a very clever piece by Daddy Da, it's called Freud and the Scene of Writing, in which you know he looks at the Wunderblock, but he's also interested in how the psychic apparatus is constructed. And Daddy Da does a very beautiful job, one of his better pieces, in, in, you know, at least in terms of Freud. I mean, you, most of you know that his wife was a, an analyst, not a psychoanalyst. Yeah, anyway. Uh, so, from this point on, dreams impose a theme that may be called Herbartian. They are dream thoughts. A dream is the accomplishment or fulfillment of a desire or wish. That is to say, it is something psychical or ideational. Okay, this is no news to us, but anyway. Hence, the, the perpetration speaks of cathective neurons, not of cathective neurons, but of cathected ideas. So, in a way, in the session, if you if you will, and this is to me a radical thing, you take these cathected ideas and you begin to undo and try to figure out what is really really going on in terms of why you're invested. This is another thing that someone people have said against the neo Freudian movement. What is left out also is sublimation. That nobody analyzes why do we choose what we choose to do? You know, why do, and how to analyze our sublimations. That very very little of this, this is again part of the Americanization of this. Why do you choose to be a lawyer? Why do you choose to be an accountant? Why do you choose to be a, a professor? You know, et cetera, et cetera. What, what, what is this about, you know, ultimately? And, you know, and then to analyze that sublimation as we go forward. All right, so the first change entails another one less visible is perhaps of greater importance. Again, and remember last week we had the methodological principles. You know, at the end of, um, I mean, the last time we met, you know, we went over these principles, uh, which is, you know, back in pages 40, you know, uh, 45 through the end uh, in, in this book. So the epistemological um, um, reflection on models, the schema of the psychical apparatus oscillates between a real representation, as that was the machine of the project, and a figurative representation as will be the later schemata of the topography. We should try to understand this ambiguity. And I think this is where you were going to, right? I mean, into yes. this, this, this. Uh, the two changes disclose a more radical transformational 
affecting the red, uh, radical transformation, affecting the relationship between the topographic economic explanation and interpretation on the other. And Ricord's going to play with these two terms, explanation and interpretation, throughout this whole work. This is what he's doing. This is really a meditation on inter interpretation through Sigmund Freud. It's not only Sigmund Freud on interpretation. It's a meditation on interpretation first and foremost, okay? So, in the project, that relation was left unclear. This interpretation of symptoms, which arose from observations of transference and neurotic patients guided the construction of the system without itself being thematized within the system. As a result, the systematic explanation seemed to be independent of the concrete work of the analyst and of the patient's own work on his neurosis. Such is not the case in the interpretation in dreams. Here, the systematic explanation is placed at the end of a process of work whose own rules have been elaborated. The express aim of the explanation is to present a schematic transcription of what goes on in the dream work that is inaccessible, I mean, excuse me, accessible only in and through the work of interpretation. This explanation, therefore, the explanation is explicitly subordinated to interpretation. First we interpret, in that interpretation is the explanation, right? It's not by accident this book is called The Interpretation of Dreams. The Interpretation of Dreams. So then he goes on to talk about the dream work, effect signs, uh, you know, and symptoms. So um, I'm trying to think about what, if I can give you a few hints here. Um, the two main processes, page 93, in the interpretation of dream, condensation and displacement. Most of us know this, but just to re-familiarize ourselves with, meaningful operations comparable, and this is good for Chris, comparable to rhetorical procedures. Condensation and displacement. Yeah? And this is part of how some literary critics have, have read. Page 93. Freud himself compares condensation to an abbreviated, laconic turn of phrase to a lacunary expression, it is at the same time a formation of composite expressions, each of which belongs to several trains of thought. He compares displacement to a shift away from a central point, or again to an inversion of emphasis or value, whereby the various ideas of the latent content transfer their psychical intensities to the manifest content. These two processes attest on the plane of meaning to an over-determination Here's your Althusser, how he takes this up in terms of an analysis of Marx over determination and contradiction. This is where he's getting it from, these kind of processes. Very, very interesting. Each of the elements of the dream content is said to be overturned or repressed in the dream thoughts many times over. Overdetermination also governs, it, though in many ways, condensation and de displacement. Right? So, you know. Althusser forgot displacement, although it was presupposed in the essay. He didn't put the third term in. Right? This is clear in the case of condensation, where the problem is to set out or make explicit a multiplicity of meanings through fit free association. But displacement, which concerns psychical intensities rather than the number of ideas, right, also requires overdetermination to create new values displace interest, disregard the point of intensity, dis to disregard the point of intensity, displacement must follow the path of overdetermination. So, overdetermination, then stated in the language of meaning, is the counterpart of processes stated in the language of force, <coughs> right? Condensation <coughs> means compression, displacement means transference of forces. So you can see he's beginning to take the meaning of the project for scientific uh, psychology and use this in terms of analyzing, you know, or, or, or explicating Freud in the interpretation of dreams. That, you know, so this is good. Condensation means compression, right? Displacement means the transference of forces. Very interesting. Displacement is the transference of forces. Right. So it goes on to, you know, the, the, um, the, um, um, 
the, uh, from the dream book, it seems plausible to suppose in the dream work a psychical force is operating which on the one hand strips the elements which have a high psychical value of their intensity, on the other hand by means of overdetermination creates from elements of low psychical value new values which afterwards find their ways into the dream content. If that is so, a transference and displacement of psychical intensities occurs in the process of dream formation and it is a result of those that the difference between the text of the dream content and that of the dream thoughts come about. The process which we are presuming is nothing less than the essential portion of the dream work and it, does, it deserves to be described as a dream displacement. Dream displacement and dream condensation are the two governing forces to which activity we may in essence describe the form assumed by dreams. Interesting, huh? This is phenomenology again, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of Freud. Thus, there is in the same relation between overdetermination or multiple determination and displacement there is between meaning and force. Okay? So, I'm going to go back to Derrida for a second. You know, the first book that, of Derrida that became kind of actively passed around and looked at was the book called Writing Indifference. And in that book is Freud in the scene of writing, but it's also preceded by a text called Force and Meaning. So there is a hidden interlocutor here as well, <laughs> who is Jacques Derrida, too, you know, that's, that's uh, actually happening. Yeah. So if you want to take a look at that, that should be av available online easily, uh, too. Okay. So anyway. Um, so multiple determination, by the way, this is a term that um, Marx Marx, Marx uses, right, in his own work, well, and m like most of the Marx, like Marx it than yeah, well, overdetermination is already there, but multiple determinations, too. I, yeah. think, I think Freud's uh, came first, because he precedes, yeah. right? Well, no, they're, they're more or less no. synonymous, aren't they? Overdetermination. Well, he's he's saying the same relation between overdetermination or multiple determination and displacement is oh, that like oh. between meaning and force, right? Okay, so anyway, we're going to go into this, the same mixed discourse, and I'll end with this paragraph, and then we'll pick up with this next time since it's getting late. The same uh, mixed discourse is required by a third process which gives dreams their specific characteristic as scenes or pictures, the scene of writing, you know, or the scene of the dream. displacement in the floating signifier. Yes, exactly, okay, or pictures, whereas condensation and displacement accounted for the alteration of themes or content or representation denotes another aspect of regression that Freud calls formal regression to distinguish it from temporal regression, which we have already spoken, and from typographi typographical, typographical regression, which we shall speak of later. Such representation leads itself to description in terms of meaning. Thus will one note the breakdown of syntax, the replacement of logical relations by pictorial, pictorial equivalence, the representation of uh, negation through the union of contraries in a simple object, the resemblance of the manifest content to a mime or to a rebus, right? And in general, the return to a concrete pictorial expression. Putting aside for the moment the question of sexual symbolism, which has been too much the center of the discussion and whose exact place we shall see later, let us pose in its full extent the problem that Freud himself describes as the regard for representability. In this connection, what is seen to characterize dreams is the regression between beyond memory images to the hallucinatory revival of perception. Thus Freud says in regression, the fabric of the dream thought is resolved into its raw material. But this regression to images, just described in terms of meaning as the hallucinatory revival of uh, perception is at the same time an economic phenomenon that can only be stated in terms of changes in the cathexis of energy attaching to the different systems. Okay? So why don't, why don't we stop there, um, you know, and, um, um, you know, he's going to go through a, a, a couple of dreams. Why don't we pick that up? We'll go back to the narcissism, which we didn't really, you know, get into today. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, one crucial thing here is the um, is the movement from um, autoeroticism 
And uh, on, um, I, don't, I, I guess you all have different um, texts here, but he's going to talk about the distinction between ego libido and object libido. Okay? I, I don't know if you got it. But that, that's going to be very important, right? Um, and um, section two, I think, is mostly uh, uh, polemic with uh, Carl Jung. And section three is one with Alfred Adler, um, you know, in terms of you know, who the antagonists are. Um, I think about some other crucial. Yeah. Um, So we'll talk about primary and secondary uh, narcissism too, and then uh, uh, the whole thing about being in love, which is towards the end of the essay, which I think is is interesting, consists in a flowing over of ego libido onto the object, the power to remove repressions and reinstate perversions, right? And it exalts the sexual object into a sexual ideal. So he's going to be going back and forth on these kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, forms of, of narcissism, and the n narcissistic type of object choice, and then the libido object, right? And so this will be interesting to see these distinctions. So this is a crucial text. Yeah, go ahead, uh, David. Is, uh, no, yeah. sorry, is this in record? record or no, this is, is in Freud himself. Freud in this is the 1914 essay, uh, you know, and it begins on the relations of narcissism to autoerotism, and... Uh, also, the the uh, the differences between uh, you know libidinal object and and uh, uh, object um, autoeroticism, new types of psychic energy, and then the value of two concepts is the important part: the ego libido and object libido. Yeah, and and he how he observes this from both neurotic and psychotic processes, how he begins to see this in terms of breakdown. That's another thing. People that were critics of Freud, why does he study healthy people? <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why does he study healthy people? Yeah. Anyway, okay, so we'll, we'll pick up with it next week. Hopefully all my allergies will be gone, too. Listen, I want to I point out that the narcissism, the essay here, is very important for group psychology and the analysis of the ego. I know some of you have read, yeah, sure, some of you have read uh, Mass Psychology of Fascism of Reich, you know, and um, uh, it's a great book. But I also think that right now, looking at authoritarian personality, identification, what's going on in terms of leadership and what that might mean, that group psychology and the analysis of the ego, or in German, better translated literally as mass psychology and the analysis of the I, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, et cetera. So how one then is influenced by this mass and psychology and what goes on. So this is a kind of precursor, if you will, that could be read in that context, especially in terms of cathected, you know, libidinal economies. Because really, in a way, to me, this is the beginning of what, you know, uh, Lyotard and others have called the libidinal economy. Lyotard writing a book called the libidinal economy. This, this piece, 1914, begins that kind of study that we can do, and which the left has never done except a little bit through, like, you know, very, very little studies on the digital economy, you know, and then and, and out there. Very, very few. Yeah. It's always about economics. Yeah. Always about getting too, too much, or, you know, or, you know, what, where something's successful or not. But uh, we don't really talk about the digital economy and, and the Texas, what that psychic investment's about. Why is that happening? What's being going, you know, what's really, really going on, right? Or something like that. Yeah. Any, any questions? Yeah, George. Yeah. I just, I think Le Bon's The Crowd. Yeah, is very is, influential on Freud. Yeah. And, yeah, but that's uh, in terms of getting up. When I read it in the fall, I was, I was able to see Donald Trump through it. You know, whether he, of course, he doesn't read, but as far as the way he's... Well, the people around him yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, some some uh -huh. people are reading. Thank yes. you. Yeah. No. I mean, you, you know. I mean, you know. Look, 
you, Steve, you create Steve. the brand, you, you, uh-huh. you, know, you basically but promote the brand. It's been a while, but issues of repetition, things like that, and the whole mass psychology sure, is a good Sure, sure, sure. It's a good is study. Is Peter coming or not? Yeah, he's coming. In coming. white yeah, supremacy. Yeah, sure. it's, actually, it's interesting, too, if you read um, Ewan's History of Public Relations. That Stuart Ewan's, Ewan's uh, book on Captains of Consciousness? Uh, or which the, one? Uh, the oh, the other one? PR yeah, yeah, the, the uh, book on PR, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and he goes through... Um, you know, the way that uh, Bernays is working out of the, uh, this, this tradition, obviously Freud, but also Le Bon, and uh, Ortega Gasset. So you can see how uh, Trump as a master brander is getting, you know, this stuff through the advertising public relations discourses. Trump has never read Le Bon, Trump never read Freud, Trump never read Bernays, but he's uh, well trained in the discourses that grow from those roots. Well, it's very, it's very, I mean, handled very well. Yeah, and when I say trained in the well, discourse, yeah. I mean, again, yeah. like, you, you can't articulate the actual discourse. Yeah, I mean, you, we, we almost know predictably what he's going to tweet out <laughs> after something. <laughs> but the <laughs> thing is, it still gets out there, and then the media, I mean, I've done, I mean, a preliminary kind of, you know, speculative study. I mean, you turn on MSNBC, I'm going to tell you, Every other word almost is Trump for five right, hours right, between right, between right. six o'clock till eleven it's o'clock. By the time you get to Brian, whatever right. his name is, you know, Maddo for an hour, she character. can't stop herself. You know, uh, Chris Dan Matthews Dan can't stop himself. <laughs> uh, Chris, uh, well, the other guy, <laughs> yeah, uh, the other guy. Yeah, yeah, and well, Mueller report. Well, that's NPR. Yeah, the biggest, they can't that's stop that's talking about. That's the gift horse to Trump. The Mueller report. Well, I mean, I just did it for, for the study. <laughs> for one time. For the study. One time. So, I mean, you know, I, I believe in education and pain. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's painful. Yeah, it's very painful, right? <laughs> right, 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 right. But it is an education. Also wrote about mass psychology, didn't she? Well, she wrote a book on the origins of totalitarianism and why Johnny can't read. Yeah, no, they were all fascinated by this. You know, the letters... You know, sometimes you learn a lot through letters. The letters to Fleiss in terms of how Freud is coming to these ideas and where the speculation is going. It's always good to read this extra stuff. You know, uh, with, um, with uh, obviously, Hannah Arendt, their work on the bureaucracy, the, the, uh, with the way she describes the United States and its bureaucracy and what she goes on in, with Carl with Jaspers. Auden. With Jaspers. Auden was in love with her. Oh, really? Yes. Auden proposed to her. <laughs> so he I give you a nice transition into he did get married he to did, someone yeah. else yes but, he did uh, yeah, yeah. he tried the other side well I think <laughs> I he preferred the other side he did like the, the original side that he chose yes that's right yeah. so but anyway um, yeah um, yeah I mean I, I, I can't you know this has been a bonanza to the media you know, uh, Trump sure. has Trump has made people. I mean, nothing but rich and famous. Wow. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, Rachel there's Maddow six, started on Air America. You know, she, you know, uh, very well, you know, educated. But she was Air America with uh, Al Franken. Right. Yeah. In the beginning. Right. Yeah. And look where Al Franken is compared to Rachel. Maddow. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing. You know, you too. Yeah, we start the U two movement instead of the Me too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. So, so um, anyway, but yeah, you're you're right. I mean, he's he's, he's you know completely completely a, a cre- creature of uh, you know the history of Bernays and the beginnings of public relations in this country. This is refined into high science. I mean, these people sit around at you know uh, thousands of dollars per hour that you know sit there and mold character. Yeah. Create context. Yes, <laughs> context <laughs> and, and content. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What's your content? Right. But I, I, I think yeah. it's a mistake, though, <clears throat> All right. to, to sell Trump short in, in certain ways. I think Trump, oh, the, right. the bookies have him. Uh, the, the 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 bookies that are good and know what they're doing, they got him odds on favor to win in 2020 yeah. right now. Oh yeah. But yeah. I, I think Chomsky did in one interview. I mean, Chomsky hasn't been great lately, but I think in one interview where he discusses Trump's role in, in the uh, balance of forces and you know. In the, Society and the economy is really good. How you know the, the the elite can't stand Trump by and large, you know, but he oh, no. he serves it well. I mean, personally and in, 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 in well, personally they find him repugnant, but yeah, but yeah, they love him. Finish. I mean, the fact is that he, for them, he he is able or, or they're able to identify various segments of, of the the populace. 
that they wanted to use to keep keep themselves in power, being a tiny minority. And Trump's somehow with each one of these the evangelicals yeah. and the, you know the, the, the white working sorry. class, whatever. Um, you know, leaving aside the black working class, of course, um, he he somehow is able to speak to each of these groups, a whole, a whole number of them, and tailor and, and, and bring them in in a way he has a feeling for how to how to talk to them and how to bring them in. Those are the audiences he's been researching very carefully. For well, I don't, I'm, I'm yeah, really in a the, certain the, sense. The, the, yeah. the audiences for conservative radio are audiences yeah. that Trump has purposely cultivated for the last three decades. I mean, that's yeah, and he's been brought, brought along by his mentor, Roy Cohn, too, in, in, in much of that. But, uh, Steve oh, Bannon. <laughs> yeah, I think they're better uh, mentors than Roy Cohn on the Trump. Uh, Probably. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's for the, you yeah, know, just the mass Trump. consumption, yeah. Yeah. But, in some um, ways. Yeah. Any, anyway, I think it's it's interesting that, that Trump well, is, is, is able to address each of these various constituencies and pull yeah. them in. Th think yeah. about it this way, too, vis-a-vis yeah. -vis some of the things we've tried to do here in, in some way. He's also, you know, he's been able to master the lack of attention economy, right? Mm -hmm. That people's attention spans are decreasingly less and less and less. So the key phrases, the use of the Twitter, all these kind of things, you know, the one sentence, the one word, right, right, the key right, word, right. all this kind of stuff, there's really a mastery in terms of the repetition. If you begin to study the patterns, right, mm -hmm. instead of the way they do it on, you know, the, me the, the so called media mavens, the way they do it, oh, he said this on July 15th, you know, back then, and he's repeating them. No, study it in terms of its context, when it's used, mm -hmm. et cetera, and then you can see the patterns, but you, you know, and then it's predictable, but at the same time, it has an effect because people are waiting. What's been created mm -hmm. is this. You know, in, in phenomenology, this expe expectation, this expectation of a fulfillment. Right. We wish for this. Mm -hmm. We want this, in a sense. Right. And he obviously is is a is a representative of something that people really feel, in in, in, in you know, in a lot of ways. You know. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I'm not sure he's all that predictable. If he really was predictable, I don't think people would be so eager each night to uh, his constituencies to tune in. I mean, well, I mean, did you expect him to say, I gave $2 million to get this guy out of no, Korea? No, no. I mean, of course well, not. Well, that's another right? thing. Right. Of course, he'll, he'll change everything. Because, right. uh, I mean, even if they put it in face in front of him yeah. and say, you signed the check here, you know, well, he's still going to deny it, you know. The contrast with Reagan, who when confronted with the, with the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, the uh, arms for, you know, the, no, Trump's to, much more dangerous than Reagan. Yeah, well, no, was, Reagan yeah. said, "Well, I didn't, I didn't think I was actually trade, trading uh, arms for hostages, but I guess when I, you know, when you look at the evidence, I have to admit that, uh, that, that I was, right, even though right, I don't really right. realize." morning in America. But, yeah. the, 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 you know, the example of um, Trump's being able, for example, with the Mer Mueller report, yeah, going from being ecstatic over it on uh, based on Barr's spin on it, right, um, to when he actually saw the result, he turned on a dime and began attacking it. You know, viciously, you know, and with all of his rhetoric and vitriol, and his constituency didn't miss a beat. I mean, you know, they right. followed right along. He knew, but it was not necessarily so predictable that he was going to change like that. He was really attacking, blaming the Democrats for the Republican Mueller, right? Yeah. I mean, he changed, just changed it around. I mean, yeah. that's that's yeah. part of the of the uh, of the shtick. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just. Backwards, inside out. When people the, the real problem is yeah. the liberal. It's not really Trump. In no. My mind. Yeah. Right now, the real problem is the liberal. It's the liberal media. It's the liberal people in, in Congress. When they start talking, well, we've got to be slow on the health care. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to absorb a little more Obamacare, kind of protect that. Maybe we'll go Medicare after 50 or something <laughs> like that. It, it, you know, it's disgusting when you really think about it because the opportunity, once again, has presented itself to go to the other side and at least open up the discourse. But you've seen nothing since, and I'm not a big supporter, you know me, I'm not a big supporter of Bernie Sanders, but it's been nothing but an onslaught against uh, Sanders. I don't think Biden would have gotten near this yeah. race had Sanders not been in it. I think they've been talking to him. This guy's leading. There's no candidate that's yeah. going to be able to step up to him. You better get in, Joe, you know, Sleepy Joe or whatever, Uncle Joe <laughs> or whoever. Creepy yeah, Joe. et cetera. Yeah, Sleepy Joe. <laughs> okay. Right, right. So, you know, like, we, like, we, like a new sandwich, you know. We're going to read about narcissism, and you hear a lot yeah. about yeah. Trump being a narcissist. Is he? 
Yeah. Well, let's let's look when we read it. We can we can use them as a model. We throw that word around. We can use them as a model. We throw that word around. We're all narcissists in a certain way. I mean, you know, listen. I'll bring I'll bring a book on on. Um, Narcissism and Perversion by a, a, an English uh, psychoanalysis, Schmerkel. It's very good. It's about creativity and uh, the narcissist and narcissism. And it's very good because there's a positive narcissism. I can, I can name you many leftists that have positive narcissism. There was a book with this. No, title. no, really, I'm serious. You know, where the narcissism yeah. is, is productive in a way. You know, yeah. yeah. He was handsome. Very productive. I'm telling you, he was it's not a nasty world. I mean, it's, 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 it's something that has now been, it's become associated with this, but in a way, yeah, it's, it, clinically, it's, it's descriptive. It's a descriptive term, and now we're going to try to see what kind of an analytical force and uh, meaning it has. It's he's, he's going to go through so different. often. Yes, but let's, let's, we're going to look at it deeper, I hope. I mean, you know, hope so that we don't use it in this thing. But it, some of you may remember Christopher Lash kind of popularized yeah, the term cold, in the uh, culture of narcissism yeah. way back in the that day. Was very popular. <laughs> exactly, the me generation. Yeah. You know, the me generation. That was the uh, the attempt there. When Stewart was writing Captains of Consciousness, mm -hmm. Norman Lash was writing that, you know, and yeah, yeah. And, um, did it make a dent on the? No, not really. I mean, you know, yeah. So I mean, what what, is, what does Wall Street do with narcissism in Madison Avenue? It sells you more <laughs> of it. You know, get yourself in training. You know, you need six pack abs if you're gonna get a, get a date. You know, I mean, you know, you know, you know how this you know works. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still working on it. Yeah. I might get there in another ten <laughs> years. <laughs> yeah. After made in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So. so, but anyway, it's it's very yeah right. Yeah. So um yeah so uh, yeah we're gonna read this because it, it's a it's a very dense piece and it's also I think very relevant and it's very interesting in how this is used both by consumer society and consumerism, by, you know, how Madison Avenue and public relations feeds this, how molding works with this. You, you see this, you don't think there's not, in all, every sports game, you would think you're listening to William Faulkner after the games, giving you their performance on the court in the NBA playoffs <laughs> or something like that. You know, that these athletes have been, you know, set up now to give commentary on, on the game like it's, uh, you know, meaningful, you know, to the whole culture. But people watch this. I mean, they stay glued. And, and this is a culture, again, that is, is privileged. We're going to do a special issue on uh, sports for situations. We're going to do a thing on, you know, aesthetics, political economy, all these things. I, I wrote Kareem uh, uh, a letter because I'd like to have... Did he yeah, answer? Yeah, yeah, I answered, yeah. <laughs> we'll see, I peeped that, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, he's, yeah. he's good. I'm, I'm sure good. he is, yeah. but well, is I, he good? I played the jazz card with him. I, I told him I can get him into any. I can get into any jazz card. I, told him, I can get him in any. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> competitive athletic, competitive athletics has become the template or paradigm of the whole political. My, my thesis is that the Afro-American Revolution, or if you want to call it black freedom and black liberation movements, were basically defeated by the privileging of sports over everything else yeah, in this culture. And it I mean. starts very, it's very actively, you know, in the, uh, and, and yeah. the reason Kareem doesn't coach is because he's outspoken. He knows the game as well as anybody, but he's kind of blacklisted or silently blacklisted from actually coaching in the NBA. Tell him you'll get him a panel and left forum. <laughs> All right, I give him good speakers. Too. I give him a, a, not only a panel. Get, get Kareem, a, a, Kareem, and, Kareem and Bill Russell. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Keynote, <laughs> left forum. Yeah, key, keynote address? At left forum, okay. yeah. Okay, on the sky hook? 